They appeal to people who are not natural SNP supporters. They don't necessarily support Scottish independence. They say, lend us your vote to send a Remain message. And it appears that that may have happened. Now, the Brexit party look like they have come second here with 15% of the vote. People talk about Scotland being a Remain country because it voted by a majority to remain in the EU. But it's not unanimously a Remain country. And we can see that from the Brexit party coming second. The Lib Dems have done really very well gaining a seat, almost doubling their vote from five years ago. The Labour Party are the ones who have suffered very badly in this election, losing probably, we think, both of the seats that they held in Scotland for the European Parliament. They've lost about 17% of their vote. Now, that may be, as I say, people who have voted Labour in the past lending their votes to the SNP to send that Remain message. But the Lib Dems are up significantly as well. Maybe some Labour voters who wanted to send a clearer message about their thoughts in the EU lent their vote to the Liberal Democrats. But what's pretty clear here is that the SNP are the ones who will be celebrating tonight if they really have taken half of all the seats in Scotland. With that in mind, Sarah, what can we say about the kind of uh, momentum behind the calls for another referendum on independence? Because, you know, will the SNP be able to use this sign of strength as some kind of case for Nicola Sturgeon to press on with that with even more force? Well, it will certainly give them a boost in morale and in momentum. And of course, momentum is everything in politics. When you are seen to be on the up, then people are listening to your arguments. You have an audience and people are receptive to what you want to say. And as you say, Nicholas Sargent argues not only for a second referendum on Brexit, but also a second referendum on Scottish independence. Now, given that they went into this election clearly saying this is about the EU, it's not about independence, so you can vote for us even if you're not a natural independence supporter, it's a little bit difficult to turn that into an argument that says, look, Scotland wants to have a vote on independence. But what they can say is, look at these results and look how different they are from the way the rest of the UK voted. That shows that Scotland is politically a different country and they'll use that to help bolster their arguments as to why Scotland should have a choice as to whether it wants to be an independent country. Sarah, thanks very much for now, and um, we'll be back with you later on. Sarah Smith, our Scotland editor. Um, before we bring the panel back in, and Laura's uh, with me, of course, as well, um, let's just have a uh, let's just ask Rita for some comparisons here between you know different local authorities because the counting is happening in local authorities within these regions. Um, those that were strongly leave and those that were strongly remain, and what what have we found in there? Some stark differences, which won't surprise you, Hugh, but the detail is very interesting. So we are characterising a strong leave council as being a council where 60% or more voted to leave the European Union and a strongly remain council is where 60% or more voted to remain. And you can see here in the strong leave councils, the Brexit party way ahead of everybody else on 45% of share of the vote. And the Conservatives are in joint fourth place with the Green Party on just 9% of the share. In the strongly remain councils, you'll see it's the Liberal Democrats who have uh, gained the title of the party of Remain, if you like, in those councils on 24%, a clear lead over the other parties. And Labour is in uh, second place, but only just ahead of the Green Party. So really stark differences there. You can see that reflected in the map of the uh, United Kingdom as it stands at the moment. So we've got lots of results in and you can see there a great deal of turquoise representing the Brexit party, a lot of yellow in Scotland for the SNP, quite a few splodges of orange for Liberal Democrats. Now, I've got a couple of startling facts here. You can see a little bit of red on the map. That means that Labour has come top of the poll in those areas, but it is only in seven local authorities in the entire country that Labour has come top of the poll. And if you look carefully, you won't see any Conservative blue. And that's because the Conservatives have failed to come top of the poll in any single local authority in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rita. Laura, thoughts on that? astonishing for both yeah. of our main parties when yeah. you hear it so starkly laid yeah. out, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, in the, in the abstract, that is an astonishing yeah. thing. Yeah. And on this set of results, it suggests on this European election yeah. that Brexit is basically breaking the hold of the two most established parties. And, and there we have the and, heart yeah. of this political storm. Yeah. Uh, there you have Nigel Farage in uh, Southampton in the, uh, the southeast region. 
And it's uh, important to remember the last time these seats were fought in 2014, UKIP was top of the poll then. So yes. in European elections, it is not unprecedented oh, yeah, for a small outsider party to swoop in. And of course, the Brexit party have built on that inheritance from UKIP, but so far they are outperforming UKIP. Let's just join this. And I'd like to start, first of all, by thanking the 67 local returning officers and their administrators and all the staff who have worked tirelessly on these elections, which have been... Thank you. Thank you very much. That will be very much appreciated because many have also been running local elections prior to this and obviously we had to run them at very short notice. So thank you for that. That was really appreciated. I now have the results. I, Mark Heath, being the Regional Returning Officer for the South East Region of England at the European Parliamentary Elections held on the 23rd of May 2019, hereby give notice and declare that the number of votes recorded for each party or independent candidate is as follows. Change UK, the Independent Group, 105,832. Conservative and Unionist Party, 260,277. Green Party, 343,249. Labour Party, 184,678. Liberal Democrats, 653,743. The Brexit Party, 915,686. The Socialist Party of Great Britain, 3,505. UK European Party, 7,645. UK Independence Party, 56,487. Jason Guy Spencer McMahon, 3,650. David Victor Round, 2,606. Michael Jeffrey Turberville, 1,587. And I therefore declare, and once I've declared them, I would invite them, invite them to join me on the stage, please. The following candidates have been duly elected for the South East region. The first seat allocated is the Brexit Party, and the candidate awarded the seat is Nigel Paul Farage. The second seat allocated is to the Liberal Democrats, and the candidate awarded the seat is Catherine Zena Bearder. The third seat goes to the Brexit Party, and the candidate elected is Alexandra Leslie Phillips. So a second seat to the Brexit party. We'll stay with this list, uh, Laura, because Nigel Farage may well say something and we'll, we'll stay on that. But a very strong performance there, of course, for Brexit party here. But Lib Dems again in a strong the second place. The fourth seat goes the to the Lib Dems Green again party in a strong the second place, absolutely. Is and again, Alexander? the Tories falling back appallingly. In that region last time out, the Tories were in second place, only just in behind UKIP. This time, nowhere near it. Look, the Greens getting an MEP yes. in, this, in this area. The Lib Dems, second in behind Nigel Farage. In the coming weeks, the it will be Liberal interesting Democrats to see what they the do with this. So we've heard from Brexit Party representatives tonight. They now are going to try to demand some kind of role in negotiating the Brexit deal or how we leave the European Union. That seems very difficult to imagine how they might do that, but a and very strong show. negotiation sure is that? <laughs> Quite a negotiation to get us out as soon as possible without a deal. Surely they're not going to suggest somehow taking place in Westminster negotiations, but they are clearly going to seek some kind of role. And we know that Nigel Farage is extremely good at making his case to the public in a way that appeals to a certain kind of voter. And he's done that again. A second Lib Dem seat going up there. And there are 10 uh, MEPs. This is the biggest region in terms of seats, by the way, the southeast of England. So uh, there are 10 MEPs being elected for the southeast region. And last time around, the Conservatives had well three seats. Danielle Hannan has returned as a Conservative uh, 
uh, MEP, and um, he's been one of the uh, prominent Brexit campaigners. And I think we're, we're almost there, aren't we? Another Brexit Party member. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Another couple. Another couple to go. We need another page. We need another page. It's a big. It's a big region. Okay. It's a big region. Another Lib Dem seat. Judith Bunting. Wow. Three for the Lib Dems. Very strong performance by them as well. And uh, Jo Swinson will get a chance to say something, but she's nodding very happily while she's watching these results in the studio. And the 10th and, and the last one more. seat for this region is allocated to the Labour Party. And ah, the candidate for of the seat is John Howarth. Ah, Labour's John Howarth. And he's coming up, so um, Labour's John Howarth, who's, uh, who's been a previous uh, MEP. I will now invite the candidates in the order elected to make so sure... So I think we'll now hear from Nigel Farage. Farage, you were first, thank you. Mr. Returning Officer, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Never before in British politics has a new party launched just six weeks ago topped the polls in a national election. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. There's a huge message here, massive message here. Uh, the Labour and Conservative parties could learn a big lesson from tonight, though I don't suppose that they actually will. The new date is the 31st of October. Uh, we, in the Brexit Party, have got men and women of considerable business experience. We want to be part of that negotiating team. We want to take responsibility for what's happening, uh, and we're ready to do so. I hope the government is listening. I have to say this, if we don't leave, on October the 31st, then the scores you've seen for the Brexit party today will be repeated in a general election, and we are getting ready for it. Thank you. Well, there's a, a warning from Nigel Farage. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, if that Brexit doesn't happen uh, in October, when the latest deadline is set, um, there'll be a general election at which the Brexit party will uh, try to make its point. Um, we may get a declaration from Manchester in a second, but Laura, quick thought on that. Well, I just wonder if Mark Francois thinks that Nigel Farage is right. Because the problem in all of these strong messages that are coming through, clear messages, is that they don't help us move forward in terms of actually having a resolution to all of this. You know, if you have a very strong showing from a party that wants to take us out of the EU straight away, very strong showing from parties that want to stop Brexit altogether, as a country, that does not help us actually move forward with the resolution. So people have told us again tonight, well, leavers want to leave, let me, remainers want to remain, yes, course, and, the, and the attempt at actually trying to move forward in, in, in the middle has just not found any appeal with voters in a really profound way. Well, on that, that's the issue. Well, well, on that point, right, the withdrawal agreement mm -hmm. tonight is clearly as dead as a dodo. It's gone, it's finished. So the default position is that we leave the European Union on Halloween. There are only really two things now that can prevent that. One is if there were to be an extension of Article 50, right. but that only happens if we request it. It can't be extended, as it were, against our will. And if they agree to it. Uh, well, indeed. But, I mean, we, if we don't ask, it doesn't matter yeah. what they do. Yeah. So you've got to assume that a pro-Brexit Tory Prime Minister, uh, someone like uh, Boris or Dom Raab or Steve Baker or someone else, would not do that. So then the only other way of preventing it would be an act of parliament. And that's extremely unlikely because one, the so-called Cooper Bowles Letwin bill that tried to do that only got through even then before by one vote, twice, and that was before these results. And I think many MPs who blithely voted for Yvette Cooper before these elections, when they work out the result in their own seat, are not going to do that again in a hurry. So these elections materially increase the chance, which I'm delighted about, of leaving on the 31st of October, even if necessary with no deal, although what I and most of my ERG colleagues want actually is a free trade agreement rather than no deal. It's also got implications for the Conservative leadership contest. Now, that will go to our members. We knock it down to two, and it's, we've got about 140,000 members. It goes to a postal ballot. All the surveys by Connor Conservative Home, which is our fanzine website, if you like, show very clearly 
that any Brexiteer candidate beats any Remain candidate that they're matched off against. All this does is it amplifies that, because the only way to fight a Brexit party is to deliver a true and genuine Brexit. So one of the results of the, uh, the consequences of these results in terms of the Tory party leadership mm. contest is that anybody who voted Remain in 2016, their campaign is now over before it's begun. It turbocharges, basically, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the case of a leading Brexiteer. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Joe? Well, I mean, what we see from this is the Liberal Democrats have gone up the most in these elections. If you take the UKIP party as the, pre the predecessor to the Brexit party. No, this is different. You, this is different. No, oh, no. Oh, if you could yeah. perhaps let me speak, Mark. Um, so you see this huge surge. And indeed, you see the Greens going up. You see this huge surge in support across the country for people saying, no, enough is enough. This is an absolute mess. And what we need to do is put it back to the people so that they can decide. No, because you, you, you've you had all these different potential competing visions of Brexit. The Brexiteers, you can't even agree amongst yourselves what it looks like. We've just had a vote. Like. Look, we've just the, had a European the, election you, let, let and your the finish, Brexit Mark. party yeah. romped Mark, let it. Your you finish. can't even agree amongst yourselves, let alone what was said back in 2016. The suggestion that we go ahead with something that has such a profound consequence for generations to come without the confidence that that is what people want to happen. And I'm sorry, but on, on this result, the suggestion that people are suddenly up for a no-deal Brexit, I think, is a very unsafe suggestion. Well, the party were advocating that one I, hands down. I, I think but you've but got with, 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 you know, a third, just, uh, just a little over a third of the vote. I mean, so the suggestion that we go on that path it is very unsafe. But there's a we need to put this back to the people. That is the only way to resolve it. We there's just a fundamental did. challenge uh, that is... Um, I mean, I am absolutely convinced that a no-deal Brexit is an economic catastrophe. Well, I'm not. Country. I'm neither of the British people. If you could just let me finish, Mark. Um, uh, I, you know, I've got 4,000 steel workers in my yeah. constituency yeah. who depend on frictionless trade with the European Union, and I am absolutely convinced that if we leave without a deal, th those steel works are in serious jeopardy. The big problem on the second referendum side is there's never been a pathway to getting there because... Uh, you know, we had an opportunity, I think, if we'd voted for the withdrawal agreement bill, that at committee stage we could have actually had a, a set-piece debate and a vote on having a second referendum, but the people campaigning for a second referendum didn't want to get the withdrawal agreement bill through its well, second reading. Voted so it down three we've, times. we've got a, this situation where lots of people on the no-deal side have stood up and said what they want, but haven't thought about the implications economically. Well, and people on the second referendum side have stood up and said what they want, but without setting out a pathway to get there. And if you have politics which is only about the what and not about the how, you are going to end up well, in a with, serious with mess the House and that of is Commons where we are now. The has voted on whether or not to have a second referendum three times in the last few months. We've debated it for hours. We voted on it three times and every time we voted on it, we voted not to do it. So it's not as if You've this hasn't been... You've seen a building for that clearly between those votes, whereas the House of Commons has been very clear that no deal would be a catastrophe because it's the government's own it's the government's own papers yeah, that yeah, set out, yes, on the economy, but also on issues like but, security. But, but Joe, here's yeah, the difference, absolutely. right? The House of Commons has voted on certain propositions. We're elected by the people. The people voted today, and they voted to leave. The party that advocated leaving, even with no deal, okay. has well, won stop hands for a second. down. Stop for a second, smell guys. the coffee, We've Joe. got. Well, listen, let's smell the coffee in Manchester. We've got a declaration coming up. Being the regional returning officer for the European parliamentary election in the northwest electoral region held on the 23rd of may 2019 hereby declare that the total number of valid votes as notified to me given to each registered party and individual candidates is as follows change uk the independent group 47237 Conservative and Unionist Party, 131,002. English Democrats, 10,045. Green Party, 216,581. <laughs> Labour Party, 380,193. Liberal Democrats, 297,507. Yeah! 
the Brexit Party, 541,843. UK European Union Party, 7,125. UK Independence Party, 62,464. Aslam Mohammed, 2002. Robinson Tommy, 38,908. <laughs> I therefore declare that the following candidates have been duly elected to the North West Electoral Region. Claire Regina Fox, the Brexit Party. Yeah. Theresa Mary Griffin, Labour Party. Yeah. Chris Davis, Liberal Democrats. Yeah. Henrik Isa Overgaard Nielsen, the Brexit Party. Yeah. Gina Dowding, the Green Party. Julie Carolyn Ward, the Labour Party. David Richard Bull, the Brexit Party. Jane Elizabeth Brophy, Liberal Democrats. So there we have the result from the North West region of England, and this involves eight MEPs. Uh, so let's have a look at the result there. And we have Brexit Party once again topping the poll uh, and uh, electing three MEPs for the Brexit Party. Uh, Labour on two, uh, having lost one. The Lib Dems on two, having gained two. The Greens on one, having gained one. The Conservatives losing two seats. Um, to have uh, no seats at all and UKIP losing their three as well. Let's look at the share of the vote in the northwest of England uh, because, um, again, repeating the pattern we've seen elsewhere, uh, the Brexit party on uh, over 30%. Uh, Labour in second place here on 22%. The Lib Dems on 17%. The Greens on 12 The Conservatives way behind on 8% with UKIP and Change UK um, behind them. And if we look at the share of the vote uh, in terms of the change, we see... 12 percentage points down for Labour, 13 percentage points down for the Conservatives and uh, UKIP, well, a, a big drop, but then as we've seen throughout the night, a big transfer, it seems, of votes from UKIP last time to the Brexit Party this time. But the Brexit Party clearly also taking votes from um, the Conservatives and Labour too, so it's a, it's a mixed pattern, isn't it? Um, I'll I'll talk to my um, new guests on the panel in a second, and I'll introduce them properly, but uh, nice to see you all. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do first is go straight to talk to uh, the new Brexit Party MEP, Anne Widdicombe. Uh, Anne, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, congrat good morning. Congratu congratulations on the result. Um, what does the result tell Thank us, you. do you think, about our national political picture? Well, I think it's very straightforward. The people have once again voted to leave because there was only ever one reason for voting for the Brexit party. We didn't cloud it with any other issues. We said, vote for us if you want a Brexit. Uh, and that is what the nation has done big time tonight. Uh, we've only been around for six weeks. Uh, and so I think what this does is send a very clear message to Westminster again, that if they don't sort out leave, uh, then you know, at the next general election, both the big parties are gonna face carnage. Well, of course, no one's going to deny, Anne, that the Brexit Party's done very well. But the Lib Dems have done exceptionally oh, well, and the Greens have done exceptionally well. How would you explain that, then, if, that's, if this vote is a, oh. a vote to leave? Wakey, wakey. I said the Brexit Party made it about one thing. Uh, there are numerous reasons for voting Green, uh, not just because they stand for Remain. I mean, if you're worried about climate change, you're worried about the oceans, whatever it might be, you vote Green. The Lib Dems have already got a very solid following, um, and in the same sort of way that people tribally vote Conservative or vote Labour, uh, they would vote for Lib Dems. They've got policies, they're very good locally. There are numerous reasons why people might vote for those two parties, but, and this is what nobody can deny, only one reason for voting for us, and we have topped the poll, whether you like it or not. Well, I mean, you, of course, you have dropped the to top the poll, but the Lib Dem message was clear in this. It was stop Brexit. You can't get any clearer than stop Brexit as a campaign theme, can you? 
No, I'm not, I'm not saying that that is not so. What I am saying is that there are also other reasons, and people have told me them, other reasons for voting for those parties. And indeed, when people talk to me about the Greens, they have usually talked about things other than Brexit. So I know there are mixed reasons. And that is why I think Nigel Farage was so right to say, and a lot of people criticise him for it, but he was so right to say, we're not going to cloud this issue by making policy pronouncements now about what we might do after a general election. We're going to focus on the question of the moment and the nation has sent an answer. And those voters looking at this now, Anne, and thinking, OK, uh, the Brexit party done very well. What is now going to change in practical terms? What is this party going to do now that it's fought this campaign and it's got these MEPs elected? How is the Brexit process now going to change? Well, first of all, uh, I think this sends a message to Westminster, which will almost certainly guarantee, I can't say certainly because you never know these days, but should certainly guarantee that the next Prime Minister is committed to delivering Brexit by the 31st of October. I think that is one very big achievement tonight. Our slogan was change politics for good. I think we've already pretty well changed politics uh, over the next few months. Uh, so I think there's that. But also what we are saying is we believe, we don't expect to be listened to, but we believe that we now have the moral authority to be involved in the negotiations because uh, we are going to be the biggest party uh, in the UK delegation at the European Parliament. But, so, so just to be clear, which negotiations are those? Getting out of the EU from which, by the way, we should already be out. We shouldn't even be having these elections, Hugh. These elections are a clear demonstration of the farce that has enveloped Westminster. But, Anne, there are no negotiations. The negotiations have been done. Theresa May spent years on them, and there was a withdrawal agreement. So which negotiations are you talking about? I am talking very straightforwardly that we should have a say in what Brexit looks like. That is what I am talking about. And I believe we would. And it's pointless to say that the EU can just sit there and refuse to talk to Britain because the EU has as much interest as we have in getting this sorted. They have believed until now, and with good reason, I may add, uh, that they could just do what they liked with us and that we would comply. Well, the British people, unlike its politicians, have given them a different answer. Yeah, of course. I'm just making the point that the negotiations formally have terminated. We're heading towards the deadline of the 31st of October. There are no other negotiations planned. So I'm just puzzled as to where, where the Brexit party intervenes oh. in this process. How does that happen? Oh, that, that, that's fascinating. Nothing else is planned. So whoever becomes prime minister is going to do absolutely nothing between now and October the 31st. Is, is that what we're saying? What, what that you... is a nonsense. And you know it is a nonsense. So you think the negotiations are going to be reopened? I think we can put pressure on the EU, but actually I'm not interested in their further concessions. I want a clean Brexit, and that is where we've got to put our pressure. Anne Whittacombe, good to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, with us, Tobias Elwood for the Conservatives, and uh, John Ashworth for Labour, and Sean Berry for the Green Party. You're very brave turning up and uh, getting into the lion's den, and Anne Whittacombe was pretty feisty there, I thought giving us some answers. What did you make of it, Tobias? Well, she didn't give us all the answers. I mean, firstly, can I say thank you to all those people who did vote uh, Conservative. It's important to say that. But can I also say I understand why so many people didn't, why they stayed at home. Many people didn't think this was going to be an election that we we're going to have. Some people used it as a protest vote, vote one way or another, to support a very binary position that they have mm. on the referendum. Did you expect to Brexit. do so badly? Um, yes, we did, because, as I say, the background drop to this is it doesn't matter that the, you know, the growth of this econ economy is doing well, that employment is high, that we're the most greenest uh, country in the G20. All that is completely subsumed, overshadowed by the one issue of Brexit, which we have failed to deliver to the British people. So there's a trust issue that we recognise, and that's why it's reflected not just on Thursday, which we're seeing today, mm. but also in the local elections a couple of weeks ago. So we have a massive... Um, challenge ahead of us mm. to regroup, to re-energize, to focus. And that's why I hope this leadership contest that we're now having does actually provide that answer. Um, just, just, I'll come to John in a second, but, but, but that leadership contest <coughs> should result in a leader who is 
where is that leader strategically on Brexit, in your view? Where should that leader be? Well, that leader needs to look to unite the country, look to not just speak to the base of my party, but actually to increase the base of my party, to look beyond it, to actually speak for the nation, to try and unite a nation. Even the numbers that are coming out today are more or less divided actually into thirds. You've got those Remain, who supported Remain parties, you've got those who use Brexit to, to, to vote for Brexit, and then those in the middle that were trying to support a party that did try and provide an answer to Brexit itself. But I, I stress the point, and I understand why the, there's an appeal of Brexit. It's really straightforward, yeah. their message. Get out of, of Europe. But when you probed uh, Anne Whittacombe just there, you did not get an answer as to what her Brexit actually looks like. And that goes back to the referendum itself. Mm -hmm. We all still, even today, have so many different views as to what our view of getting when, out or even remaining in Europe looks like. When you talk about a leader who can unite, does a leader who is openly proposing or considering a no-deal Brexit, is that leader likely to unite or not? Well, I, one of the, uh, I think the shortfalls that we made in the first batch of negotiations was to set red lines, to set uh, circumstances that we'd refused to budge from before we'd even got to Brussels. So I've been critical already, I've been outspoken to say, please, let's not do that in this leadership contest. We mustn't you know, limit ourselves as to what we can do in further negotiations. And the call for no deal is clearly an appeal to the base. Okay. And I hope that this election isn't, uh, the leadership election is actually about who's the best for the country, not just party membership. I will ask you the same question, Don. Did you expect to do so badly? Oh, gosh. I mean, where to start? I mean, it's a very disappointing result, isn't it, for the Labour Party? And I'm so sorry for very good Labour colleagues who have lost their seats tonight, like Claire Moody in the South West. There's others in other parts of the country. It's hugely dis disappointing. Uh, look, I mean, we're going to have to really reflect on these results and understand what has happened. The first thing that strikes me is that all those people who voted leave in the Brexit, uh, the original referendum, still wants us to leave and are very angry we haven't left. But there's also a huge number of people who are very angry, who voted Remain, who are very angry and want another referendum. Yeah. Now, we as a party tried, having been a party that campaigned for Remain in the referendum, we tried to engage the 52% who voted leave. We tried to put forward a proposal which brought both sides together. But clearly this election has become a kind of mini referendum, a kind of binary choice, and Remain voters have clearly gone to the Lib Dems and uh, uh, the, Gr the Greens, yeah. and uh, the people who want Brexit have clearly gone to the Brexit party. Because your message is not clear. Well, I think our message is clear. We, ha we were putting forward a compromise, but in this type of election, people didn't want to compromise. They, might, well, they wanted to sort of rerun the referendum. But of course, we've got to understand that. We've got to reflect upon that. We've got to discuss that in our party, amongst our members, and at the Shadow Cabinet level. I'm not, I'm not remotely complacent. I think it's, a ve it's very serious when you're losing huge numbers of votes uh, uh, to the Lib Dems in Islington, but equally we're, we're losing mm. in bowls over. Yeah. Yeah. And how does a Labour Party, which aspires to govern for the country, keep both sides of that coalition together? So we've really got to reflect on that and, mean, and do some pretty heavy thinking. I think I'm fair in summarising Emily Thornberry's message earlier when she, she, she was basically saying, look, um, you know, th this is the moment where we have to just take stock and realise that the policy position we've been putting forward uh, isn't working. Now, you don't seem to be going that far. What are you saying, that you should take a look at the policy again? That you should look more seriously at the p possibility of a second referendum? Or, you know, what are you suggesting? Well, I mean, I mean we, have, or we have supported a second referendum. But, and the occasions, it's very qualified, isn't but it? But the occasions when we've been given an opportunity to vote for a second referendum in Parliament, we've voted for it. Mm. It didn't go through because Tory MPs didn't vote for it. If Tory MPs had voted for it in those... Should it be a more vote, formal Labour proposal? But we do have a formal Labour proposal. That is that we were putting forward a compromise solution to try and bring both sides together. And if we couldn't get that compromise solution in order to block a damaging okay. no deal, they would go for a referendum. It now looks like, by the way, we're going to get Boris Johnson as the Tory leader, the mm. Tory Prime Minister, who on the back of these results will probably go for a no deal. Okay. And we've got to work across Parliament. If, if, you, if you don't support that, you've got to work with us to try and block that. And perhaps blocking that, the way to block that, to block uh, it, it, it is a referendum. Sean, we've mentioned several times this evening, before you came on, um, the fact that you put in a very strong performance in several areas. So before you comment on it, I'm going to ask Rita to tell us about your performance, okay, <laughs> and to see some <laughs> figures, okay, and then, and then we'll ask you, Sean, to comment on that. Thanks, Rita. Okay.
I'm under no pressure, Sean. You probably know all this already, but not everybody does. So, yes, the Greens are having a very good night, really. Um, their share of the vote has gone up from around 8% last time these seats were fought to around 12% now. They've gone from having three MEPs to seven MEPs. And look, they've come top in two council areas. A really strong result from them in Bristol. Look at this. The Greens on 35% there, um, uh, way ahead of the Liberal Democrats on 23%. And this was a Labour voting area um, five years ago. Um, but the Greens um, overtaking them really it, with a very, very strong performance. Interesting that turnout here is 44%. So that's up by 8% in Bristol. Uh, Bristol was a very strongly Remain voting area, and there's been quite a lot of comment as to whether or not turnout has been higher in Remain voting areas than in Leave ones. We'll have to crunch the numbers on that shortly. Uh, let me take you to the other big green success which is Brighton and Hove. Now this is an area where the Greens are traditionally strong and they've put in a strong performance again. 36% of the share of the vote, uh, well ahead of the Liberal Democrats. So they'll be very happy with those two results. And I just want to go back to that page uh, in order to again reflect on the fact that the Greens have come top in two local authority areas here. That is two councils more than the Conservatives who have failed to come top in any single local authority area in the country. Well, that's fascinating. And I'm just going to, with that in mind then, Sean, okay, I'm just going to also go back to something Anne Whittacom said earlier, mm -hmm. where she was saying, look, um, a vote for the Greens is not just about Brexit, it's about lots of other things, which I think is a fair point. People do. I, I think that's votes, true. I mean, so, so people using the Green vote, if I can put it that way, to say this is an anti-Brexit vote, are they right or wrong? Absolutely. It was the clearest anti-Brexit right. vote you could send, you okay. could make. But also, I mean, we we were, I'm, I'm funny that I have to say this because normally we get accused of being a single issue party, but, but compared with other parties, we were not standing on a single issue. We were also standing for bold action on climate change, plus dealing with the causes of Brexit. And that's the thing that I think um, the parties here who've done extremely badly by being unclear on their where they're going to go next with Brexit um, and have done very, very badly compared to the parties who are very clear about where they stood on Brexit. I think that's where they have really messed up, which is not dealing in those three years with the causes of Brexit, not going back and listening to those places that were crying out for a voice and saw Brexit as the way to express, um, you know, their, their views, their opinions about being ignored. Um, so they need to, these parties really do need to take stock. They need to go back and talk to people in those areas and listen to them. And that's what Greens have been doing. That's why we did so well in the local elections. And it's also why we did particularly well in these elections too. So it isn't just about Brexit. But can I say, on the question of who did best in terms of Brexit versus Remain. Um, I hope you're adding up the, the overall percentages of the vote mm -hmm. for the Brexit party, which I've got down as 32% so far. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got the Liberal Democrats on 20% so that's far. Right. I was on 12% so far. Right. So that's already level with the Brexit yes. party. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then you've got Change UK, who managed about 3% mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So that is the combined votes of the very, very clearly Remain parties. Mm -hmm ahead of the Brexit party mm -hmm. there. The point has been made a few times. Now this yeah. is yeah. not yeah. Yeah. a victory yeah. for Nigel Farage's party. And I think you saw from what Anne Widdicombe said just then, they intend to do nothing now apart from complain that, that we haven't left with no deal, which was basically their only policy. So I think we, you know, we are in a, in a position now where we have to be looking at all of the parties who are not standing for nothing at all other than yeah. leaving with no deal to, to come together and put forward something that that helps to deal with the causes of well, brexit um that to puts come together, together in a way that they've that, singularly that agrees on so some kind yeah. of deal to put to the people yeah. and then puts that deal okay. to the people it's the only thing we can see that can take us forwards now well, you, when everybody's well, rejected that the establishment party is so badly but, but are crying out for something new and they've seen that in the green party you've led very neatly to our projection OK, which you'd be very pleased about. So let's have a look at the projection and I'll bring in John Curtis in a second, because this this is the set of figures that uh, Sean was partly referring to there. So if we look at this projection, because not all the results are in, but lots of them, most of them are, um, the Brexit party is currently on 32 percent, according to our projection. Um, and uh, as Nigel Farage was saying, you know, we won the election, but that's because they're at the top of the poll. However, you can look at these results in different ways, and John Curtis will help us to do that. The Lib Dems on 20% on the current projection, 
um, a surge in support for them. Labour on 14, the Greens on 12, as Sean was saying, and uh, the Conservatives way back on 9. The SNP have done a very strong showing. They're on 4%. That's the Great Britain projection for 4%. But in Scotland itself, it's 38%. So that's, uh, um, you know, that, that, that 4% figure is slightly misleading on there. Change UK on uh, 3%, uh, UKIP on 3%, uh, other parties on 2%, and Plaid Cymru on 1%, though in Wales that is 20%, um, uh, or thereabouts. So it's 1% on the GB um, projection. Yes? Um, Sean is smiling. Brexit, She's smiling that the, I've the, gone the through all those parties, figures, okay? Yeah. But I have gone through them just to make the point that, uh, of course, you can add them up in different ways. And John, um, if, if, if people are looking at this uh, and thinking, OK, Professor Curtis, tell me, is the result of this election pro or anti-Brexit, what would you say? I'd say to them it's probably best read as approximating to a draw. Um, <laughs> and I draw that conclusion by taking into account two pieces of evidence. The first is the party's avowed stance, but secondly also the evidence of the opinion polls as to which were the parties that were overwhelmingly drawing their support from either the well of leavers or else the well of remainers. Now, two parties, both in favour of leaving without a deal, overwhelmingly, almost entirely supported by Leave voters, the Brexit Party and UKIP. Total vote, 35%. There are then three parties, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, and Change UK, which again are in favour of a second referendum and who, according to the polls, their support again overwhelmingly came from Remain voters. I'm leaving out the Nationalists, by the way, particularly in Scotland, because they were one of the very few parties that were A, successful, and B, according to the polls, were getting quite a lot of Leave voters as well as Remain voters. So let's just stick to the three parties that are A, pro second referendum, but B, were overwhelmingly being backed by Remain voters, according to the polls. Tally, 35%. So I think the honest truth is that what this election has actually done two things. One is to, remind, to demonstrate just how polarised the public are on this issue, that indeed most Leave voters at the end of the day would prefer to leave without a deal rather than not leaving at all, but most Remain voters are very attracted by the idea of a second referendum. And as John Ashworth has just admitted, the attempts to come up with a compromise, at least so far as the public are concerned, have proved unconvincing and have, in the end, acquired very little enthusiasm in what, in effect, has become a de facto uh, uh, second referendum. Um, but, it, so, but to that extent, at least, however, also a reminder that actually the opinion polls have been telling us for a long time that support for Remain and support for Leave is still very close to each other. And again, you know, this, uh, there's nothing in this election to guarantee what the outcome of a second referendum would be. We are a polarised country and we are a div evenly divided country. And that's one of the reasons why this Brexit impasse is going to be very, very difficult to resolve. And I think uh, as of the early hours of this morning, finding a pathway that is at the end of the day going to bring the country together, well, shall we say, if the Conservative Party can find a Prime Minister who can fulfil that role, uh, then they're probably going to have to be Churchillian, or maybe I should say, should say uh, you know, even Thatcherian or, or, or whatever, or Blairite in their standing. They're going to have to be a very, very good Prime Minister to be somebody who can bring this country together over something which is now very, very clearly divided in. But bring the country together, as you say, John, but, you know, it needs a policy which can reach out in different ways to different people, and that yeah. seems to be supremely elusive. It, it, it is indeed. I mean, we can then, uh, you know, this time of morning we can speculate. I mean, clearly, it's difficult to see how you can turn leaving without a deal into a compromised position. Um, leaving with a deal perhaps could be turned into a compromised position, so long as the deal was sufficiently attractive to remain voters, but certainly Mrs May's deal was not only attractive to leave voters, it's also unattractive to remain voters. The idea of a, refer a second referendum perhaps could be turned into something less divisive if indeed much more effort were expended than certainly has been so far in trying to persuade leave voters, look, you face a House of Commons that isn't willing to, get to back 
uh, leaving without a deal, um, and therefore, as a result, uh, uh, leaving and leaving itself as being rather stymied, uh, uh, let's therefore put it back to the people, so the people can indeed demonstrate if this is their view that actually they do wish to leave the European Union on either leaving without a deal or on some terms and conditions yet to be specified. Um, the trouble is, however, is that most of the campaigning for a second referendum, and certainly all the parties who are saying they're in favour of a second referendum, are all ones that are in favour of remaining inside the European Union. So therefore, at the moment at least, this is not a process that could be presented as a neutral way out of the Brexit impasse. And maybe it is now too late for it to be resold as, an, as, a, as a way out. And therefore, one has to say how our politicians get out of this mess while it's not very obvious at all. John, many thanks once again uh, for the projection there. John Curtis there. Quick comment, Laura. It's a very cracked crystal ball, but in terms of the here and now, we shouldn't forget how appalling this night is for the Tories, for the mm. governing party. This is their worst performance as a party since going back to 1832. Mm. And in the council areas that have counted so far, 311, the Tories have not come up in a, come top in a single one of those areas. So if this was a first-past-the-post election, they wouldn't have taken a single seat. For a governing party to be performing like that, it's really dreadful for them. Well, on that note, let's go to Southampton and uh, bring in uh, Daniel Hannan, who's there for us, uh, the newly elected Conservative MEP there. Um, uh, Daniel, thanks very much for joining us. Good morning. Um, what's your take on your own party's morning, performance? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, the last thing I want to do is, is to argue with the wonderful Laura, who is, is of course, brilliant. But I, I think we, we've done a lot worse than we did in 1832. I think in, in terms of national vote share, we, we, uh, even if you count the 350-year Tory prelude rather than just the, the 185 years of the Conservative Party, I think this is our worst, our worst ever result. And, and actually, look, you, but you don't need to be a sophologist to, to, to understand why. You don't need all of those clever experts and, and gizmos you've got in the studio. We voted to leave and we haven't left. I mean, it's, it's that simple. And, and as long as that remains the case, a chunk of the electorate is going to be polarised on this issue and is going to vote for effectively the single issue pro and anti-Brexit parties. Um, do, do you think that it's possible to reunite the country, as John Curtis was saying, the next Prime Minister, whoever it is, or if there's an election later this year? But you know, Do you think that that possibility of reunification is there? A possibility and an imperative. I mean, for heaven's sake, we have got to stop this awful culture war that we've had for three years now. People calling each other the most appalling names, insulting each other, you know, treating fellow countrymen as though they were they were enemies, uh, because we're still stuck in the arguments of, of 2016. In fact, it's, except it's worse, because the actual 2016 campaign, which I was very involved with, I thought was fought in a much more friendly way. I, when, when we were running Leave Street stalls and we ran into the Stronger In guys in their blue t-shirts, we would we'd pose for selfies together, we'd wish each other luck. The nastiness has come since that result came in, and the longer this is drawn out, the worse it gets. So we need, yes, to make Brexit happen, but we need to do it in a way that carries the majority of the 48% with us. It, it may go too far for some, not far enough for others, but there must be a way of finding a close and cordial relationship with our European allies, which nonetheless respects the referendum result and restores our legal sovereignty. Uh, what does this result do um, in terms of the momentum of the Conservative leadership campaign? What's your reading of that? Well, I think all the all the plausible leadership candidates are now saying we will leave without a deal if that is the only way of leaving. And paradoxically, that may be the best way of getting a deal, because I don't think the European Union ever really believed that Theresa May was prepared to walk away from the table. And of course, there were powerful voices in Westminster telling them, you know, hang tough here, we might yet reverse the whole thing and, and get Britain to drop it. So the EU was never incentivized even to begin to engage realistically with us about a mutually beneficial outcome. I think we need different credible leadership in order to make that happen. But the one thing I don't think we're short of is talent. I think uh, that there are plenty of able, clever, patriotic, energetic, uh, potential Tory leaders out there. And your choice is? I only get a vote when the MPs have narrowed it down to two. I'm just an ordinary party member, so I'll, I'll have a look and let you know then. You don't have a choice now. I, I, like I say, we're pollulating with talent. I think there's no, really no shortage of people who can do this. You tease, Daniel. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Daniel Hannan there in uh, Southampton. Um, what do you make of that advice? 
I, I, well, firstly, 1832, I think it then took a military leader, Duke of Wellington, to then yeah. pull things back together for the Conservative Party. And I think not the party, but the nation is looking for, for greatness now to actually give us that energy, that uh, inspiration, that vision, that uh, excitement to remind us to be less risk averse, to move forward and unite us again. It's a massive challenge. And the numbers that have just been uh, put forward by Lorna and yourself shows that actually the situation has not changed. Act views have entrenched from the referendum itself. It seems to be a draw. And the Conservative Party, rightly, is being punished. And my worry, as uh, Daniel was just sort of hinting there as well, it's easy to get into number 10 if you're a contender. You press the right buttons. You, you know, get your, your whistle out and, and sing, the, you know, put out the right tune. You will get into number 10. The tougher job is staying there, is winning the next general election, is putting the nation first. And that's what we need to do. It will require compromise. I, I heard the, uh, the courteous uh, uh, Marc Francois speak to you earlier before. You can't have entrenched positions such as that in my party if we want to continue thinking we're going to stay in number 10. We have to compromise. The damage that this is doing internationally. I was in Italy last week for the 75th anniversary of the Battle of uh, Monte Cassino. And it was interesting getting the perspective of what Britain, how we're seen abroad. We're seen as a nation that participates, as we did then, on the, on the 75th year, five, uh, about to celebrate the uh, D-Day landings. We step forward as a nation when other nations hesitate. We're not doing that now. We are so boxed in to do with Brexit. And until we get a resolution, that compromise, uh, we will then be prevented, prohibited on participating on that international stage as the world changes very fast indeed. And nobody, nobody is stepping forward because more and more nations are becoming more populist, more protectionist. Uh, as China is on the rise, so is India as well. Africa is changing rapidly. We have a reputation internationally. We've got our heads down in the sand, con continue discussing Brexit. It's not good enough. And no. this leadership contest must be more than about this, but about where uh, Britain goes on the international stage. Do you detect an appetite for compromise, Sean? And, and indeed, you know, given what you've said about Brexit, and you've made a very coherent uh, case for lo lots of people, um, where is the appetite for compromise there, do you think? I think, I mean, we need to go back to the people and ask this again, and we need to go back to them with something that's passed through Parliament. So that's where compromise needs to be made. But I think what you were saying earlier on and showing the places where we, we came first, I mean, what that says, I think, if, if we, the Greens, are winning the majority of, of votes in council areas, that suggests that we're going to win seats and, and if there was a general election tomorrow, the Conservatives would struggle to win any seats because we have a first-past-the-post system. Now, I'm not in favour of first-past-the-post system, but if that's the situation we're in, the Conservatives and Labour are both in terrible trouble looking at these results and they do need to be listening to people. They do need to be working out something that we put back to the people so that people can have that say. Um, I mean, John, John Curtis's analysis yeah. Um, was was quite fair, although I don't I don't agree with leaving out the nationalists. I think yeah. that the yeah. um, applied um, and yeah. the SNP, who sit with the with the massively growing green group in the European Parliament, to be as well, I think uh, were very very clear about being be Remain yeah. parties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the latest opinion polls, where you ask people, do you want to to leave or do you want to remain? It's now fifty six remain to 44 leave. That's quite a gap compared to where we were in 2016. And the young people who turned out and voted in enormous numbers, for particularly for the Greens, because they're not so keen on voting for the Lib Dems, they, they are having their say for the first time in these EU elections and they want their say. We need that democracy of a people's vote. And it's up to Parliament to find something to put to people as the deal to compare staying in the EU with. And, and we would be happy with that because that would be democracy. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, by the way, uh, Tobias, you mentioned uh, you've been to Italy. It was the Monte Cassino. Um, so the Italian political picture, of course, is very interesting for us as well. And I, I, what I'd like to do now is go to Milan and talk to my colleague there, James Reynolds, and talk to us there about the, uh, the activity there with the nationalist and populist parties there, including uh, the party of uh, Mr. Salvini. So, James, tell us what's going on. Uh, Matteo Salvini came out ahead. Uh, the vote show he got around 32% of the vote. Uh, that came top. And there was the centre-left uh, Democratic Party potentially next. And then the populist five-star movement followed. But bear in mind this. 
in 2014, the last European election, Matteo Salvini got 6%. His party got 6% in that poll. It's now got around 30%. It's the first time the League has topped a national election. They're already part of the government. And I think what this result does, really, it cements Mr. Salvini's position as the leading, the dominant politician in Italy, despite the fact that he's not the Prime Minister. He's technically only the Deputy Prime Minister, but he is the most powerful person here. He wants that voice to be raised now in Europe. But bear in mind his rhetoric is this. He doesn't know, he's no longer talking about leaving Europe or having referendums about the EU or Euro membership. He wants to disrupt the institutions from within. James, thank you very much for the update. We saw the tally there for the, uh, um, the Italian results. James Reynolds there for us, our correspondent in Milan. Um, why don't we join Katja once again? Katja Adler, our Europe editor, uh, who's monitoring all of these uh, results for us um, in Brussels. So Katja, just, uh, just highlight some of the more significant ones that you've seen there. Well, I think what I'd say is, you know, it's been quite a nuanced vote in the end, Hugh. I mean, do you remember a lot of those big headlines leading up to this European parliamentary election on the European stage? You know, while we in the UK focused on Brexit, the rest of the EU really worried, always excited about and the more nationalist right-wing parties doing extremely well here. The parties that are no longer, as James said, wanting to leave the EU because voters didn't seem that keen on that idea anymore, but wanted to change the EU dramatically dramatically from within. Now, they got the establishment rattled. But in the end tonight, it's much more of a fragmented vote. So the trend has been, like we've seen in general elections across the European Union, a bleeding of support out from those parties of the traditional centre-left and centre-right. And voters instead have gone looking for answers elsewhere, looking for parties and politicians who more reflect their own priorities and values. Some have gone to the nationalist right and others have gone to the far left very much also to the Greens. The Greens have had a very successful party tonight. I think something else, a big takeaway tonight, is these are European parliamentary elections, but they have had a big effect on some very powerful national governments. Angela Merkel's coalition party, uh, coalition government uh, is in trouble. Her CDU party has done terribly regionally. It's now done badly again on the European level. And the Social Democrats she's in coalition with have done even worse. So can this government survive? Can Angela Merkel last out her full term in office? A big question hangs over that uh, tonight. I think another thing is people care about politics at the moment, Hugh. I mean, European parliamentary elections traditionally have a very low voter turnout, but that turnout was up today. People really care, whether it's about the environment, whether they're voting for or against parties, they are turning out to make their voice heard. So they call today for change, but I'm not sure the European establishment is ready to give them that change. And that is something everybody is going to be looking to see. Katya, thank you very much. Katya Adler with the latest day in Brussels monitoring the event uh, of the night for us uh, across the other European member states, uh, 27 of them. Uh, let's have a look at the um, percentage share scorecard as it currently stands for the UK. Um, but with uh, the vast majority of the results in now in these European elections of 2019, this is the percentage share of the vote of the Brexit Party on 32% topping the poll. We have the Lib Dems under their outgoing leader, Vince Cable, on 20%. Uh, Labour's uh, share is 14% under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and the Greens, uh, who've got uh, co-leaders, of course, and one of them's here with us, Sean, on 12%. Um, and then we have the Conservatives in single figures on 9%. Uh, and their outgoing leader, Theresa May, uh, yet to elect a new leader. And then we have Change UK on 3%. We were talking to Heidi Allen earlier. And we have uh, UKIP on 3%. So that's where we stand. What I'd like to do now is take a little pause and go to Annabel for the news so far. Thank you, Hugh. Good morning. The Brexit party is emerging as the big winner in the European elections as the results come in. It's also been a successful night for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, but both Labour and the Conservatives have done badly. Around two-thirds of the counts have now been completed. Here's our political correspondent, Nick Erdley, with a roundup so far. His report does contain some flashing images. A vote that wasn't supposed to take place for a parliament we're supposed to be out of already. This isn't a normal election. And it looks like that will be reflected in the results. For the two parties that dominate British politics, it's been a disastrous night. 
The Conservatives took a kicking, having failed to deliver the Brexit they promised. They are on course to finish fifth, with less than 10% of the vote. Labour too are being punished. They are set to finish third, with less than 15%, sparking a heated debate over whether the party now needs to harden its support for another referendum. The big winners are parties with unambiguous policies on Europe. The Brexit party didn't exist a few weeks ago, but Nigel Farage's movement topped the poll. Never before in British politics has a new party launched just six weeks ago top the polls in a national election. The reason, of course, is very obvious. We voted to leave in a referendum. We were supposed to do so on March the 29th, and we haven't. The Liberal Democrats, too, have had a big night. They are currently second across the UK. A huge comeback, given that they won just one seat last time around. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. The Green vote is up too, and they are set to beat the Conservatives into fourth place. In Scotland, the SNP are miles ahead, at almost 40%. The party will take three of the six seats there. In Wales, the Brexit party topped the poll. Plaid Cymru came second. Labour, a party who have dominated Welsh politics for a century, finished third. More results will pour in over the next few hours, but so far it looks like a big night for parties who have taken a firm stand on Brexit and a bad night for the others. McKenny, BBC News. Well, counting is also underway across Europe, where voting took place today. It's a very mixed picture, but it looks like many of the established players have lost out. The biggest centre parties are set to lose dozens of seats, with the European People's Party projected to lose 43. The centre-right party will still be the largest, however, with 178 MEPs. The Socialists and Democrats on the centre-left are projected to lose 39 seats, down to 152. So the centre parties will remain the largest groups, just not as large as they were before. One of the parties benefiting from that is the Greens, who have doubled support in countries like Germany. The party has jumped into second place behind Chancellor Angela Merkel's Conservatives. Ireland, Finland and France are also predicting strong results for the Greens. Meanwhile in France, the far-right National Rally Party has topped the European election vote against President Emmanuel Macron's ruling party. Leader Marine Le Pen called the result a victory for the people and called on President Macron to dissolve the French Parliament, something he has already dismissed. And uh, more EU citizens voted in these European elections than in any over the past 20 years. But the same can't be said for the UK. The European Parliament said the Europe-wide turnout was around 51%. That's 8% higher than in 2014. And the first significant increase in turnout since elections began in 1979. But British turnout is predicted to be lower than the average at about 37%. And that's all for me. Now let's go back to Hugh with EU Election 19. Welcome back to the BBC's uh, election studio. What I'd like to do is maybe take stock for a moment. Uh, Laura's with me, my panel is here, and I'll introduce uh, our latest guest in just a moment. Ian, it's nice to see you. Good morning. Um, but before we talk about um, some of the Scottish results with, the, with Ian, which we'll do in a moment, Laura, just so far, mm. what are our headline thoughts? Brexit Party, the clear winners, yeah. maximising the inheritance that they got from UKIP. So they've been outperforming UKIP in these elections, really, really squeezing the Tories. Terrible result for them as a governing party, in fifth right now. But we've also seen Labour being squeezed very severely too, particularly at the hands of the Lib Dems. And really what we've seen is a bit of a replay of the local elections. So the smaller parties with clear messages about Brexit have seen their votes do very, very well. Our two main Westminster parties who've been, you know, fighting amongst themselves between the two of them and inside their own parties over how to handle Brexit they have both had a bad time indeed with some real standout results. I know we're going to talk about Scotland in a second, but Labour coming fifth yeah. 
in Scotland, yeah. coming third in Wales. Mm -hmm. The Tories not coming first in one single geographical area. Blimey, it's their worst fears being, mm -hmm. re being revealed to them tonight. Okay, let's focus on Scotland and uh, look at not just the Labour performance there, but uh, just broadly, and to just take us through some of the highlights there for us, Rita, before we bring Ian in. Well, the highlights, Hugh, really are a very strong SNP performance in Scotland. Uh, these are just some of the councils where the SNP has uh, performed very strongly. Let's go into a couple of them, uh, in, into Glasgow, first of all, where you'll see that the SNP's vote is uh, way ahead of uh, everybody else. 44% for the SNP. And remember, in the last two European elections, Labour topped the poll there. And just let's have a little look at the sh change in the share of the vote. Really, really painful result there for Labour, losing 20% of share of the vote. Uh, let's look at one other local authority area. Let's look at East Renfrewshire. Now here, in fact, the Conservatives topped this uh, poll in the last two European elections. Now the SNP are way ahead on 34%. Uh, Conservatives uh, getting just half of that. And uh, just take a look at those figures in terms of the drop in the share of the vote for both Conservative and Labour. Uh, really painful reading there uh, for both the main parties. Um, I want to show you one more thing, which is the way in which the map has changed. Um, I'll press this for you here. Uh, you'll see that's Scotland as Scotland has voted tonight. A whole sea of yellow for the Scottish National Party with just Shetland and Orkney uh, in the Lib Dem orange colours. And I just want to show you how the map looked five years ago. So that whole swathe of blue that was conservative in the border areas and red around Glasgow and Edinburgh, well, that has all changed now. And what you see is SNP yellow. Thank you very much, Rita. I should point out, of course, that um, I mean, we may have said it earlier, but we won't get the full Scottish result until, well, I think probably midday tomorrow because we're waiting for Western Isles. Uh, which Mr. Blackford will know all about. So it's good to have you with us, Ian. Thank you very much. Westminster leader of the Scottish National Party. Um, okay, so so two questions. Was this for you a one-issue election? In other words, was it, and do you therefore consider this to be, your performance, to be an anti-Brexit vote? Yeah, we were very clear. We asked people to vote for the SNP because we want to stop Brexit. And, of course... In the referendum in 2016, 62% of those that voted in Scotland did vote to remain. And we wanted to send a, a message to Westminster that we have no desire to be dragged out of the European Union against our will. And we asked people to support the SNP in the election this week. But, you know, Hugh, one of the things I would say is that we've now been in government in Scotland since 2007. We've been in power for 12 years. So to get a result like this and the map that we've just seen, to see us win everywhere with the exception of Orkney and Shetland where the Liberal Democrats won, that's really quite an extraordinary result. On the other hand, the Conservatives, Ruth Davison said, send a message to Nicola Sturgeon that we don't want a second independence referendum. Ah. But I have to say to Ruth Davidson, that hasn't worked. That's a stunning result for the SNP tonight. And I'm afraid that both Labour and Conservative have got what they deserve, the constructive ambiguity of the Labour Party facing two ways at the same time. Well, we've seen the results of that, and I'm delighted that the people of Scotland have shown their trust in the SNP, the best result we've had in a European election ever in Scotland. And, of course, that 38% dwarfs the support that the Brexit parties had in the rest of the United Kingdom, the best-performing party in the whole of the United Kingdom, mm. the Scottish National Party in this election. I'll, I'll come, come to John in a second on the message, because it's worth picking up again. But um, my second question to you was going to be just that, you know, the momentum... Uh, which this vote would, would suggest, and how that feeds into the demands that you're facing from lots of your members yeah. for a absolutely cast-iron guarantee of a commitment to a, another independence referendum. So you're saying very clearly that this vote feeds that very strongly. I think there's two things. We will work with others in Parliament to try and make sure that we end the chaos of Brexit. We want to see a people's vote. I think that's the right way to, to move ahead. 
I know deal that a number of the Conservative candidates for Prime Minister are advocating would be disastrous for our economy. So we have to stop that and we have to be prepared if necessary to revoke Article 50. And I'll be asking colleagues across Parliament to support that proposition. But I think the message for the people of Scotland is that Westminster is in chaos. There is no function in government. We have a zombie parliament in Westminster. And ultimately, if we want to protect the economic interest of the people of Scotland, then we're going to have to have the powers of independence. But the message to Westminster is that the Scottish National Party, when we stood for election in 2016, we stood on a manifesto commitment. If there was a change of circumstances, that we had to reserve that right to call a referendum. We won that election in 2016. There is a, there's a majority for independence in the Scottish Parliament. And it ill beholds anybody in Westminster that would seek to frustrate the democratic decision of an elected government in Scotland that seeks to choose to have an independence referendum. They should respect the sovereignty of the people because it's that sovereignty of the people which is at the root of this. Uh, John, what's your answer to that? Well, I mean, you talk about our position being constructive ambiguity. Look, I, I accept that our position hasn't worked in this election, but I don't think it's dishonourable to try and bring both sides in this very divided country together, which is what we tried to do. But this, this election campaign very quickly became a bi about a binary choice where you're either pro-Brexit, and it looks like you're either pro a no-deal Brexit, or you're for Remain. So that didn't work for us. Obviously, you, know, obviously you can see that in the results that we've had today, uh, t t t tonight, sorry. So I don't, I don't accept it. It's constructive ambiguity. We are trying to bring people well, together with a compromise deal. But you've bled voters all over the place, John. No, no, I, I, I and, concede and it hasn't if, worked. If, we, but if, if we're now in a situation that there's going to be a Conservative Prime Minister that wants to take the UK out of the European Union on a new deal basis, then there's a very real question that the Labour Party are going to have to face. Are they going to join with us? Because I've worked with when the Liberal Democrats. When you say join with us, what do you mean? Well, I've worked, as you know, I've worked with the Liberal Democrats. No, 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 but when you company. say join with you, what, what, but with what, the others, what procedure with the, with the in others, Parliament? The others in Parliament. What procedure are, in Parliament are well, you we, going to we use have to, to block we, it? we have to build a consensus. Well, look, we what, have a responsibility. Well, if you let me answer the question. We have to build a consensus on the basis of having a people's vote. And there are colleagues in the Conservative we'll Party that, that share that view as well. Okay. We'll we're going to have to find a mechanism to do it. But to say we can do nothing is not okay. the answer. We'll come back to the mechanism in a second. Or we've got the issue of revolt. No, I agree. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll come back to the mechanism the in a second, gentlemen. Um, I want to bring in Leila Moran, who's been waiting patiently to talk to us. Leila, good morning to you. I know it's 23 minutes past one uh, from the uh, for, for Lib Dems. Um, OK, let's have a word from you on what this vote means in terms of your party. What are you advertising this vote as? Is this simply well, we were... and clearly an anti-Brexit vote? Um, I think it's two things. So first of all, you know, back uh, with the local elections, I said the Liberal Democrats are back and we're here to stay. And this is proof that that is true. But also we went into these elections with a really, really super clear message. Stop Brexit, just make it stop. And I think what the vote share shows nationally is that it's, you know, we've second nationally. But if you add up the Remain vote, the people who want a people's vote, put it back to the people. So us plus the Greens plus the SNP and Plaid, that is a bigger vote share than the Brexit party. And the clear message that I think the electorate is sending to Westminster is that we have to put this back to the people. Um, how does this election change the process, because this is what people are asking, you know, you've done well, you've put in a very strong performance, you've added to the number of MEPs, but in practical terms, how does this change the progress or otherwise well, of the Brexit process? Yeah, so apart from anything else, it stops this rhetoric that at the last election, you know, X number of the electorate voted for Brexit parties. You know, this is now another national election in which that is not true, in fact, uh, and you can verify this, but you know more than uh, the Brexit Party actually want that further referendum. So now that puts it firmly back to whoever ends up governing this country. And you know we've got potentially a, a, well, we know we're going to have a new prime minister. What message is this sending to them? If they decide to tack to the right, Westminster will try and stop them. And there's several ways that we can do that. Uh, we've got a uh, Speaker of the House who has said that he wants to do everything he can to respect the will of Parliament. And I think this will just reassert Parliament's view, which will include a lot of moderate Tory MPs as well, who will feel emboldened by this to continue to work 
cross party, across the opposition benches to make sure that we don't end up with a no deal, which is potentially what we think is probably going to happen to the Tory party now. Um, how important will this result turn out to be for the future of the Lib Dems who are also looking for a new leader? Absolutely. I think that is critical. And we are the comeback kids of politics. We are here. We are back. And actually, if you look across the country of areas where, you know, we've polled incredibly strongly, these are areas that we uh, look on track to make gains again in Westminster whenever the next general election is going to be called. That may be sooner, that may be later. But what it's growing is our strength. We've had a membership surge in the last few days. You know, we have enormous strength now. Um, and I think what the future holds for our party is, is an incredible future, and I'm so excited by all of these election results. It's, it's a great day for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, Leila, good to talk to you. Thank you very much for waiting to talk to us. Leila Moran there for the Lib Dems. And Rita, just because um, Leila made quite a few claims there, just talk us through some of the Lib Dems uh, results so that we know exactly where they've made these gains. Well, we've got some of their best results up here on the screen, Hugh, and you can see here uh, they performed very strongly in London. In fact, they came top of the poll in London. But uh, Richmond-upon-Thames, Kensington and Chelsea, Westminster-Wandsworth, uh, all... Uh, was, were Lib Dem strong performances. Let's uh, just take a quick look at Richmond. Uh, this is where uh, the leader, Vince Cable, has his Westminster seat, of course. And look at that. The Liberal Democrats taking over half the vote in Richmond. Uh, a really stunning result for them. And this is an area that uh, voted Conservative in the last uh, three European elections. So um, a really, really uh, strong performance there. Look, their vote share up by 33%, Conservatives down by 27%. Um, I want to show you one more here on this list, Hammersmith and Fulham. So this is effectively the Liberal Democrats taking on Labour uh, here. Um, Labour came top of this, top of the poll here uh, five years ago, but the Liberal Democrats are clear winners here tonight and just Let's take a little look at the change in the share of the vote. There you have it, up by 28% for the Liberal Democrats and uh, a real plummeting in vote share for the Conservatives and for Labour. I um, just want to show you uh, how they've done in London. So you see here that this is the Liberal Democrats who've topped the poll in London. Elsewhere, of course, it's been the Brexit party. And uh, if we do this, you can see how the colours there are orange in the centre, red on the outside. Uh, that means that that's all gone Liberal Democrat there in the middle. And that's how it looked five years ago. So a very different picture, 2014 and now. Rita, thanks very much. Uh, Leila, final word for you on that list of uh, greatest hits. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I think the greatest hit of all is London. And we have to remember, we've got a mayoral election coming up next year. I think, you know, what this does is open the door to large number of voters who have lent us their vote in some cases from the Labour Party for the first time. But the fact is, unless the Labour Party decides where it wants to be or backs people's vote, I think they are at risk in London potentially next year. So, you know, great times ahead for the Liberal Democrats. The Labour and Tories need to sort themselves out. Well, we'll ask them about that. But Leila, thanks very much. And... Uh... Let you have some sleep now. Thanks very much indeed. Laura. And just as you were chatting then, I think the last result of tonight, I think, has yeah. just come in. Yeah. Lambeth, another London council area, is a Liberal Democrat gain from Ooh. Labour by a very, very significant margin. The Lib Dems there vote increasing by 23%, Labour down by 24%. Right. And for Lambeth, you know, if you don't know London, for Lambeth to go to the Lib Dems like that from the Labour Party, that is really quite something. But as you were touching on with Leila, though, and also with Ian here in our studio, it's really not clear what difference this is all going to make no. to the process. No. No. Because wherever we're at in this Brexit fiasco, it's our parliament that has to take the next steps with the next prime minister, whoever that may be, trying to lead them through it. And while these results do give us some really clear messages, they don't set out a clear pathway for the country. No, and that's it, Tobias, isn't it? I mean, that is, this, is, this is the problem with all of this. People go out to vote, they see the Brexit party, and Nigel Farage says, well, you know, this is all about delivering on uh, 2016. But, you know, where does this lead in practical terms? Well, whether it's a wake-up call or a reminder to those that are standing, uh, putting their names forward, that when you see the results of Scotland, or indeed in London, Scotland, the SNP, and Remain in London as well, 
how dangerous it would be just to move to WTO terms, what the, how, how the Conservatives would be perceived in Scotland mm -hmm. and indeed in London. The financial services are required to have a relationship yeah. with uh, Europe. Moving to WTO, they would, they would be hit by that. So that is the challenge that we face, that there are entrenched positions here. Well, and and that's, that's what the, we have to d discuss. We need to look beyond our party base and that's so critical to well, put the uh, nation first. Well, I'm bound to say to you then, you know, because you're being very open in the way you're discussing it, your party base, if we're to believe everything we read, is tacking in one very clear direction. And it's not in, in the direction that you seem to be saying is desirable. We are the oldest and most successful party, uh, political party in the world. And there's a reason for that, because we react, we modernize, we move forward. We develop our policies uh, to reflect the people around us. And that's exactly what we need to do now. And if we don't do that, then yes, we won't just lose local elections. We won't just lose um, European Union um, uh, elections. We'll lose the next general election as well. John? Well, I mean, sh surely Tory party members are going to look at these results and they're going to think, my word, you know, look what Nigel Farage has done to us. We're going to need Boris Johnson yeah. to push us out on a no deal WTO, which I think will be a disaster. I agree we've got to work together. It's not clear what the best procedure in Parliament is. But if we want to block that, guys like you are going to have to work with us to block Boris Johnson taking us out on a, on a no deal scenario, aren't you? I, I'm not going to get the ins and outs of who's actually standing in that perspective. It's more to have a proper debate about the issues. We glossed over them in the referendum. What does leave actually mean? Take back control. I understand that. When you talk to people in the northwest of, Eng of, of England and they say, what does European Union do for me? They don't see the benefits at all. It was never explained to them. And we've had 40 years where we've not really sold the purpose of the European Union. And the European Union has done itself no favors by ever drifting to more of a political union. It's really interesting seeing the, I don't know if you can show the backdrop behind us, yeah, was, but you've got it, a yeah. ball that represents the European Union. Yeah. And then you've got all the countries in Europe floating around the central figure. Mm. And that's very symbolic of where the European Union is going. Now, I'm an internationalist. I was born in New York. I've lived in Europe. I've served in Europe as well. But I don't like a European Union that is taking political power from the UK. And they need to wake up. The results that we're seeing here in Britain are reflected right across the continent. And we talked about Italy with Salvini. You talk about uh, Viktor Orban in um, uh, Hungary Marine or Le ARD, Le Pen and so forth. You are seeing a movement to the extremes. Now, let's not forget that the role of the European Parliament is also to select the new key players. So who's going to be the next Donald Tusk? Who's going to be going to be the new Juncker? Who's going to be the new Barnier? These are all people that you know don't have a job right now until November, by the way. So nobody's going to be doing any negotiating well, the point and anything until earlier. after the yes, 31st of October, exactly. which is a bit yeah. of a challenge. But, to, but the point yeah. I make is that the European Union could do themselves a favor by showing it being, being a little bit more competitive with, let's say, a, a digital market or an energy market, being a little bit more transparent as to what the Commission actually do, and a little bit more flexible on some of those issues, such as migration, that have been such a concern to British citizens. Okay, but, these, but these things can be done, Tobias, because the European Union belongs to all of us. That's where we, where we agree to pool sovereignty and we have to work together. And we have to show that sense of leadership that comes with that. And I think one of the reasons, perhaps, why Scotland is different from other parts of the United Kingdom is because we've taken that on and we championed that. And, and we have said that we have benefited very strongly from the European Union. We In Scotland, we certainly benefit from free movement of people. We need that free free movement of people over to grow our economy. So the debate's been very different. And I think we have to be reflective of all of those things as well. But I think one of the things, when you consider that we're 20 years on from devolution, so we now have the Parliament in Edinburgh, in Cardiff, and I hope we have a an administration in Belfast soon as well. But how does Westminster work with the devolved administrations? Because certainly, what we have felt over the course of the last three years, and you, 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 you know this because I say this repeatedly in Parliament, is there's been no respect to the devolved institutions, and we have generally tried to compromise with the government over the last few years. We've written papers about the single market, customs union. It's not about who's right or who's wrong, but how we could create that space where we could try and develop a consensus opportunity. And one of the things I suppose that we have to reflect upon in Westminster is that we now have minority government. And we have to recognise that no one party can actually fix these problems. Yet when you look at the devolved institutions, when you look at Edinburgh, you look at Cardiff, these, these institutions are based on proportional representation. 
Parties have to work together. We have to work with other parties to get our budget through. The way we do politics in the UK has got to change. Mm -hmm. That model that we have in Westminster doesn't work. I, and I'm we're going to have to think through that. I'd like to pick up on a point, if I may, that to Tobias made that about you know the, the trend here in terms of um, populism, if you like, if I can use that word, um, and whether that is reflected um, in different parts of the European Union. If I bring John back in again, John Curtis. Um, so, John, can we say that these elections have produced some kind of surge for nationalist populist parties, or is it more of a consolidation? I mean, how would you characterize it? I think it's difficult to argue that there's any consistent evidence of a surge. Um, we've actually tried to pull together the votes for all the populist radical right parties. Some are up, some are down. On average, it looks as though they've done more or less as well as they did in 2014. So I think certainly the argument that you know there was going to be a dramatic movement, some have done very well, such as the Lego in Italy, um, but others have not done so well. Um, and as a result, basically, I think it's going to be difficult to argue that there's some clear European-wide uh, rise in populism as opposed to, which is true of most of the party groups, some doing well in some countries, some in others. If there is a, a group of parties, a kind of party, for which there is some consistent evidence of doing well, although no, not wholly consistent, it tends to be Green Party. So the, success, the modest success of the Green Party in the UK, it does actually seem to be part of a wider pattern. And maybe, of course, you know, the environment is an area where the European unions tend to be very active and where voters are often inclined to accept that international action is required uh, and maybe, therefore, as a result, certainly you know, the European Union, for example, is just about to be very active on the issue of microplastics, that maybe this has also perhaps been reflected in what is perhaps the one European-wide movement. Um, and if I may throw a second question at you, John, because um, uh, you know, your Strathclyde credentials, not least, yeah. um, just in terms of the Scottish context, and we have Ian yeah. with us as well on this, on the SNP's performance, how do you see this changing, if it does, uh, the dynamics of the argument around independence and a second referendum? Well, um, put it like this, the Scottish Conservative Party campaigned in the referendum, in this referendum north of the border, essentially on the issue of whether or not there should be an independence referendum. And shall we say, it's not done them a great deal of obvious good. Um, and in effect, the Conservative Party north of the border has suffered for the failure to deliver Brexit in exactly the same way um, as it has, has done South Border, and that for me is entirely consistent with the evidence of the fact that probably the principal reason why the SNP didn't do so well in 2017 as it did in 2015 was not actually because of the argument about a second independence referendum, but rather because the SNP was losing some ground amongst those who voted Leave and the Conservatives was gaining in that ground. So given that the Conservative vote north of the border is predominantly a Leave vote, ergo, failure to deliver Brexit, Conservative vote uh, disappears. But certainly I think what, so it, this probably has nothing to do with the argument about independence. That said, the idea that the Conservative Party can continue to present itself as the single dominant uh, uh, upcoming voice of unionism um, that can be clearly said to have momentum that the SNP lacks. I think that narrative has died uh, uh, today. And that the brutal truth is, well, the SNP, first of all, clearly dominant in Scotland. Uh, the near 40% that they've got in the, re the election today is also in tune with what the opinion polls suggest they would get in a general election, if one were to be held now, or indeed in an early Scottish Parliament election. So it looks as though 40% or so of Scotland, for the time being, at least is firmly in the SNP's grasp. The only sort that faces um, uh, Ian Blackford is that, of course, to win a referendum, you need 50%. And the opinion polls on support for independence still suggest that, although not far short of that figure, it's still not above that figure, and that, therefore, they, we're still not in a position where we could, by any means, be sure if there were to be a second referendum that um, uh, Scotland would vote in favour of independence. Meanwhile, of course, there's a very basic problem. In exactly the same way as this House of Commons would probably not be willing to sustain a government that were voted in favour of leaving without a deal, I think we can also anticipate that this House of Commons would also not be willing to grant the Section 30 order that will be required under the Scotland Act to allow the 2014 referendum to be rerun. So the SNP dominant, but can't necessarily deliver. Okay, I'll let you answer that in a second, but thanks very much, John, for now.
We'll talk to you again in a while. Um, I'd also like to bring in uh, another guest we have at the moment, talk about um, the challenge for Labour. And this is um, a slightly different perspective for us because Darren Jones is the MP for Bristol North West. Um, Greens have done very well in Bristol, of course. Uh, I think Labour in, in, in fourth place in that region. Um, Darren, good morning. Thanks very much for staying on to talk to us at 20 to 2. It's very kind of you. Um, so let's talk about Labour's performance generally, first of all. And what can you tell us? Well, I think the Labour vote this evening makes it very clear that uh, you know, deliberately sitting on the fence is not the style of leadership that the public expects from a party of government. Uh, and as I and many of my colleagues, including Emily Thornbury and I think Jonathan Ashworth as well this evening has been saying, is that the party needs to quickly move to a position where it confirms that we back a final say on Brexit. Well, that's very clear. I'm not sure. Just stay with us, Dan. Are, are you saying that unequivocally, John? Is that your position? No, it's not, not quite that. No. I'm saying, but I'm saying that I think we certainly need to have a proper, thorough debate in the party on this. But one thing I would ask Darren and ask if, he's, if his Britain's future group is perhaps considering is that, yes, it's clear we've done badly in, in Bristol. Uh, it's clear that we've done ba badly in Camden and Islington and places of, that, of a similar sort of, sort of demographic. But we've also done badly in Barnsley and Bolsover, where the Brexit party has topped the poll. We've done badly in Mansfield and Ashfield, got to win back Mansfield. So, so the conundrum which all of us in the Labour Party and Labour movement are wrestling with is how do we maintain our votes in Bristol and Islington and so on and not lose votes in Barnsley and Bolsover and Mansfield and Ashfield? And I wonder if Darren's Britain's Future Group has an answer to that. Well, what is the answer then, Darren? I think you just need to be very clear and honest with people about the assessment that we make as politicians wanting to lead the country. And I think it's very clear uh, that this deliberate fence sitting, as I say, hasn't worked for anybody on either side of the argument. And, you know, we're in a position in the Labour Party where in the last few weeks it's been difficult to persuade members to vote for us, let alone the public. And for paid up members of your party not to vote for you shows that you've got real problems to deal with. Um, that's pretty... Um that's pretty blunt. Um, John, what do you make of that? Oh, I mean, it's certainly true. We've got a problem in the membership. I mean, there were members telling me that they uh, couldn't quite bring themselves to vote for Labour in these elections. I mean, I mean, let's not underestimate the scale of upset and anger amongst the party membership, which but is why I think we need a proper democratic debate in the party. Okay. Whether, you know, we've got the conference coming up in September, and we can't fudge this because the conference, I suspect, in September will bring forward resolutions which will uh, uh, try to give, uh, so to firm up our people's vote. Do you accept, do you accept the description of the party's position as deliberate fence-sitting? No, 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 because as I've, as I've said when uh, I, 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 Ian put it to me as well, I think there was no, nothing remotely dishonourable in a party that aspires to government to try to find a solution that brings both sides together. The country is clearly very divided. We've seen that in the elections today. And when we campaigned for Remain in the 2016 referendum, we took a decision as a party that we wanted to reach out to the 52% majority who voted leave and try and find a compromise deal. That's what we've tried to articulate in this election campaign. It clearly hasn't worked as an election tactic. But nonetheless, I still think it's important for a party who wants to be a government to find a compromise. It's interesting, though, you say now Labour has to now have a democratic debate about it. A lot of your members and a lot of your MP colleagues, and probably a lot of voters as well, will say you've been having the debate about it for two years. Well, I mean... And it's not just these election results that are suggested that it's not getting through. Well, I mean, the, 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 uh, it's clear that we've got to do something but, you know, let's not rush to quick judgments on election night. We're going to have to step back. We're going to have to understand what has gone on. But we've also got to, we've also got to respond to what's going to happen in Parliament. Because coming back to the original point, you know, I don't want to sort of um, be dismissive uh, of, of the votes, uh, not, not remotely, but in many ways, the number of MEPs that each party sends to the European Parliament isn't going, really going to affect the arithmetic in the House of Commons. Okay. And if the Tories elect Boris Johnson or Dominic Raab as their leader, who's going to push them for a no deal, then Tory MPs are going to have to work with opposition parties to block no deal through let's, whatever procedure let, let, we can find in the Commons. So, D Darren, in practical terms, what needs to happen now in your view? Well, I agree with Jonathan that we can't, uh, we can't keep having a fudge on this issue and that as an election tactic it's not worked. You know, the primary purpose of a political party is to elect politicians so that we can put in place the measures that we want to do to serve our constituents and our country. And that, that's been a complete failure for us this evening. We've lost excellent MEPs, like my friend Claire Moody 
in the southwest. We've come fourth in places like my home city of Bristol. We might not have won MEPs this evening, but we certainly won't win a general election on that basis. And that's why we do need to go back to our members to clarify the will of our party, which is to support a final say on Brexit. But I do think we need to do that sooner than conference in September, which is why I and others uh, from across the whole spectrum of the Labour Party have been calling this evening for a special conference or a ballot of our members sooner rather than later, because we do need to call for a general election. You can't have two Tory prime ministers without a mandate from the public. But if we go into a general election without a clear view on the biggest issue facing our country today, we'll be slaughtered at the ballot box as we have been this evening. Um, How confident are you that the current leadership right at the top um, is prepared to listen to that message? Jeremy was very clear in his leadership campaign uh, that he was about honest, straight-talking politics, that it was about a member-driven organisation. Our members, I think, have been quite clear already, but I'm pretty confident that a a ballot of the members or a special conference would make it clear what their view is on this. And as a Democrat, driven by members' views, I'm sure Jeremy will follow that. Um, But, okay, so, so you are confident that he will adopt the kind of measure that you are talking about now, because lots of your colleagues are not confident about that. I think Jeremy has to, if that's how he sets out his leadership for the Labour Party. Um, Is that right, John? Well, I'm not against a a special conference to really thrash this issue out. I mean, I I think there's a certain irony in calling for a referendum of the membership to decide your (laughs) position on a a referendum, given we know uh, that referendums are are not a great way to resolve very complex questions. I I think it's better we had some sort of uh, event that brings people together to discuss and to debate, rather than just a plebiscite. Uh, of the membership, but uh, but I understand why uh, uh, Darren and others are, are proposing that, and I take his point. We can't really wait till September because, it, I, I, and I, I, I wasn't trying to be uh, uh, facetious, but I was trying to sort of make the point: if if we if we think we can sort of fudge this, it will come big time at the September conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, there'll probably be a big row on the floor of the September conference. So it's actually in our interest as a party to get something resolved That's ahead of the September conference. Before the UK is supposed to be That's leaving right. the no, European indeed. Union, yeah. the clock is ticking. Very and if someone like Boris is determined... The same dilemma that Labour has been wrestling with for so long now, and just if we've been chatting another um, a Labour MP, Kevin Barron from Rotherham, has tweeted a very disappointing result. It would be ridiculous if the view we took from this was that Labour should become more pro-Remain. If we move that way, we can guarantee the loss of many seats across the country at any future election. I mean, that's the reason why Labour has had this dilemma, because inside not just their party, but inside Labour voters, members of the public, not people who are actually part of the party, there are different views. And that's why they came up with this ambiguous position, but it's not served them well. Uh, But uh, just to go back to you, Darren, for a final point, I mean, you know, we've heard time and again from colleagues of yours that the kind of thing you're proposing, I think Caroline Flint was uh, saying this earlier, they regard this as a kind of toxic approach as far as their constituents are concerned. And your problem is, of course, that it doesn't address the issue of deep divisions. I I think people like honest uh, politicians, I don't think anybody can really say that Brexit is good for our country. And the whole point of politics is to get into the debate and make the case. We need to make the case as to why we need to stay in the European Union, why that actually matters to people who voted leave, but then to set out why a Labour government would transform their lives and their towns and their communities in a way that would meet many of the challenges that they felt that they were solving by voting for Brexit. This fence sitting, people see through it. You've got to be clear and honest and fight for the things that you believe are right for the country. And I believe that we can do that as the Labour Party. Good to talk to you, Dan. Thank you very much for joining us. Dan Jones there, the MP for Bristol North West. Um, Some social media from Nigel Farage. I think we heard a bit of it earlier, but uh, let's just recap. Uh, the Brexit party leader saying this, never before in British politics as a party just six weeks old uh, won a national election. Well, hang on a bit. I think it was uh, the party was registered way before that. Anyway, um, if Britain does not leave the EU on October 31st, uh, these results will be repeated at a general election. OK, well, we heard that. That was the speech in Southampton, wasn't it? Um, we've talked a bit about Labour's challenges there. And I don't want Tobias to feel left out because you've done absolutely dreadfully as well, as you know. So what I want, what I want Rita to do is what I want Rita to do now is just explain how badly they've done as well. Yes, um, I, I can yes. do that quite easily, Hugh. Uh, it has been a night of some national humiliation for the Conservative Party, and I have assembled here a collection of their worst results tonight. And just look at the names on this screen; they are typically Conservative areas. Kensington and Chelsea, Guildford, Cotswold, all areas that you would think true blue. Well, look, they've gone either Liberal Democrat 
or Brexit party. Uh, let's just take a look at one or two of the details. Elm Bridge uh, in the southeast region. Now, this was conservative for the past three euro elections. When I say conservative, that means that they came top of the poll. Uh, just look at the change in the share of the vote in Elm Bridge. The conservatives down 31%. Ouch, that must really hurt. Uh, let's take a look at one other. Let's look at Hart. So this is where the Brexit party uh, came top of the poll. Uh, again, conservative for the past three Euro elections. And we'll look at the change in the vote share conservatives down by 29%. So, you know, some really big falls, some plummets, if I can use that word. And I know that Tobias was asking about Bournemouth a little bit earlier, that being your own patch. Well, Bournemouth, the Conservative share went down by 21%. So not quite as bad as here, but still pretty bad. Um, let me just show you what this means for the Conservatives in terms of vote share and where they come. There, there you go, 9% vote share. So they come fifth after the Green Party. And there is this extraordinary fact that the Conservatives have failed to come top of the poll in any single local authority area in the country. So if you look at the map as it is here, you see a great deal of Brexit turquoise blue, you see orange Lib Dem, you see the SNP in Scotland, some patches of red. Let me just show you how it looked in 2014. That was a lot of UKIP purple, uh, but a, a fair amount of conservative blue. That's completely gone. There is no conservative blue on the map at all. Rita, we said at the start, well, we will see we'll say, if the political map or landscape is going to change, yes? Okay, well, I think, Tobias, we can agree it's changed, yes? It has, but the question is, wasn't uh, who do you want in number 10? Who do you want running our economy? Who do you want uh, uh, representing you uh, in government? It was, what do you think of the EU? And clearly, it was quite binary, and it went one way or another on a low turnout. And, of course, the Brexit Party, not to take away did well, as did the Remain parties as well. But this quote that you put up from Nigel Farage, uh, you know, this is the first party, you know, and, and so forth. It's also the first party that I know that's actually done so well without actually having a manifesto. I looked on the website. Yeah. There's no policy there whatsoever. Now, that's a wake-up call to all of us as to how we campaign. Because it, we saw it in the United States, first of all, with Donald Trump too, that you actually work on people's fear, on people's anger. You don't say what you are actually positively for. And that's a concern I have as somebody that stepped into the democratic process. How do you communicate? How do you provide that scrutiny that you need? And that's what we need to do as we evolve again with and looking to a new leader to make sure we scrutinize the absolute values, the benefits or otherwise of uh, lurching suddenly towards a no deal. Depends who you choose. That's exactly it. But what I don't want to do is do this sort of wolf whistle, you know, noises to make, uh, to see us lurch one way without understanding exactly what will happen. We're missing out now because of the fast and furious nature of news and the simple way that you can tap into yeah. people's frustrations. And we absolutely understand yeah. that. Yeah. The Conservative Party government is being punished because we didn't land Brexit. And I absolutely recognize that. Okay. John, where you are. Uh, I thought you was going to say that the the answer is there for parties not to produce manifestos at all. I thought that's where you were going there for a, for, for a moment. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, this isn't a general election, uh, and we should be cautious about assuming that these results uh, will be replicated in a general election campaign. Because in a general election campaign, other issues will quite rightly come to the fore and be debated and discussed. I mean, your terrible record running the NHS, for example, the cuts to schools, the cuts to policing, I think just put all these levels is, of investment all the, into the NHS, oh, so. and, you, and you've got record record levels of uh, waiting lists and crisis in A and E and a hundred thousand vacancies across the NHS. So the NHS I is mean, in a real mess. Doctors and nurses. Well, you've got a, you've, you're short of forty. As I say, twenty-one million You're short, of, for, you're short of forty thousand nurses in the NHS. Your A and E's are in crisis, and the waiting lists are getting longer and longer. That's the reality of the tour. 
always when it comes to national health service. We've got record investments in it, uh, more doctors, you're, more you're, nurses, um, less managers than you had under You're cutting under public Labour. health services, you're cutting uh, the infrastructure budgets, they're cutting training. 200,000 nurses have left the NHS since 2010. This is the reality of the Tories on the NHS. Okay. And these are the issues that will be debated in a general election right. campaign. A general election will not be this binary choice about Brexit v Remain. It'll be debated, of course, but it will not be the only issue. But it issue. might be. We might be heading to a situation yes. where the general election is, is all Labour about Party being trying to let's have another referendum and stay in the European Union. It could and be an the election Tory that is called precisely for that reason. Exactly. Well, that's what it Theresa May tried exactly to do like two years ago, didn't she? Well, she said that general election was going to be. In that's what she tried. But this may be where you're both have, heading. Yeah. So there have been people for a long time who've been speculating in the last three to six months saying, look, our politics. If you look how divided Parliament is, our politics is heading towards a situation where there's going to be a choice of revoking and stopping Brexit happening or leaving without a deal. And if you're looking for evidence of that happening, tonight's results are not bad. We're running out of time. Ian, a final word. Well, you ask a question about independence earlier when um, John Curtis was on. Look, when you look at the results tonight, what we were clearly saying to people is that we want to begin that conversation. And we have to learn from the experiences of Brexit and everything which has happened in the UK over the course of the last three years. It has to be a respectful debate. We have to listen to people. And it has to be about vision and values. It has to be about the kind of country that we, that we want. There is a very real risk to us because of no deal taking place. One of the things that we want to do is deliver a stronger economy, to deliver a fairer Scotland. I think it's become increasingly clear to the people of Scotland that independence is the route map for that. That'll be a, a, another ongoing debate, I think it's safe to say. Thank you very much. Um, John, do you want a final word, just a final word on where we are and what these elections have produced? Yeah, I think, this be, I, think I want to add to the conversation about what does this mean for a future general election. Now, it's quite right. People would not have voted today in this way if there had been a general election. That said, the opinion polls have shown during the course of this campaign a rise in support for Brexit in opinion polls for Westminster, albeit at the 15 to 20 percent level rather than the 30 percent level. They have also, by the way, registered an increase in support for the Democrats of Westminster. And the Liberal Democrats' support in your elections tends, according to the polls, to be rather similar to its level of support for Westminster elections. So, yes, we can't assume that the, the two largest parties would do as badly, but at the moment, at least, Westminster voting intentions have both of them below 30%. Now, what is true is that these kind of advances in Westminster voting intentions during your election campaign surges usually disappear by the time we get to the autumn. However, is this a European Parliament election that people are going to forget quite as easily as previous ones? Mm. Because the central issue which has dominated how people have decided to vote in this election, looks as though it's going to continue to be the central issue of our politics at Westminster for the foreseeable future. And what we are now seeing is a challenge for the first time to the two largest parties, not from one end of the spectrum, such as Liberal Democrats, or the other end of the spectrum, such as UKIP and now the Brexit Party, but from both ends at the same time. We've not seen that before. So I would suggest that actually, yes, the party to Conservative Labour wouldn't do as badly as they did tonight, but there is a severe warning to them that their traditional dominance of British politics cannot be taken for granted if Brexit continues to be a major issue in British politics and they cannot come up with positions and a resolution that satisfies their, vote, their supporters. John, thanks very much again. John Curtis there for us. Um, my turn to say thanks to everyone in the studio. To Rita, thank you very much. To our friends who came in and braved the early hours, thank you very much. And for feeling the questions. To Laura as well, of course, as usual. And to all the team uh, working behind the scenes. Um, a quick look at the scorecard. Quick look at the scorecard. Here we are. The percentage share of the vote. 32 to the Brexit Party, 20 to the Lib Dems, 14 to the Labour Party, 12% to the Greens. And on we go, the Conservatives on 9% and Change UK on 3 and UKIP on 3 after these European elections of 2019. Our colleagues on BBC Wales continuing the uh, BBC World, that's uh, a Freudian slip, <laughs> BBC World, continue, if only, continuing the coverage. But uh, for now, thank you very much for watching and it's goodbye from us.
Lerma Zakins, welcome to Brussels and welcome to one of the two homes of the European Parliament. This is a BBC World News European Parliamentary Elections special. Welcome to those of you watching on BBC One and the BBC News Channel as well. Well, across the last five, six hours, we've been taking you through all of the developments coming in from the EU's 28 member states. And of course, this is in one part about the next European Parliament, but it's also about the 28 different domestic political dynamics that we've seen play out. But let's start with the European Union's projection of what the new Parliament will look like. This is based on votes counted, so it's not a confirmed result, but of course, as time goes by, more and more results are coming in. There are a number of things to pick out here. The EPP is the biggest single bloc. It wasn't the last Parliament. It will be in this new Parliament, but it's got smaller. That's a centre-right bloc which contains a range of uh, centre-right parties, as you'd imagine, from uh, Civic Platform in Poland to Angela Merkel's CDU party. Then you've got the uh, Socialists and Democrats, the Red Bloc, still the second biggest bloc, but it's got smaller. Now, what's significant is that according to current projections, well, those two blocs are still dominant, but they will not have a majority. They have had for the last five years. That's made their life easier in terms of getting legislation through. Well, Manfred Weber is the president of the EPP group, and he's been speaking a little earlier. Today's election results, the ones that we have so far, are telling us that the middle, the democratic center that's willing to compromise is weakened through this election and that it's even more necessary that those forces that believe in Europe and want to bring Europe into a great future that have ambition for Europe, that those forces have to work together. Another big story is turnout and that's made EU officials very happy. They wanted to see this go back up after consecutive elections and seen turnout go down. You can see overall turnout in 2014, just over 40%. It's gone through the 50% mark. Here's one analysis of why it's been high this time. Many people realize that, that something is threatened, something that we hold dear, uh, rule of law, freedom of press, uh, equality in our member states, and that we have a very long to-do list uh, to fight climate change, to get in control of technology, mm -hmm. to make sure that we create inclusive societies where people feel counted in, and I think that double sort of the positive, this is what we should do, and also this is what we should find, I think that is part of, of the big uh, turnout. That was the EU Commissioner Margrethe Vestager speaking to me a little bit earlier. We also spoke to the German MEP Scar Keller, who's the co-president of the Green Bloc in the European Parliament. And that is because after the main trend this evening, we can, be, we can describe a surge for Green parties across Europe. Here she is speaking to me earlier. We're very thankful for the trust that the voters all over Europe have put into the Green Party. And of course, for us, this is now a big task and also a big responsibility to put our demands into practice when it comes to climate um, protection, but also when it comes to making sure that the European Union becomes a social union. In the UK, projections are that Nigel Farage's Brexit party has won. And earlier, I spoke to its chairman. For a party that is just six weeks old, it looks like we're going to win a national election, probably something that's never been achieved all over the world from a, uh, in a developed country. And that's because uh, you know, we have provided what uh, a significant percentage of the population want. It wasn't just the Brexit party that did well. The Liberal Democrats exceeded their own expectations. They are projected to come second. Guy Verhofstadt, very well-known figure here, in the European Parliament and a leading figure within the Liberal bloc in the European Parliament says, amazing result for the Lib Dems. Congratulations to Vince Cable, that's the Lib Dem leader. I look forward to welcoming a big delegation of pro-European Lib Dem MEPs to the European Parliament. And he went on to say, together we'll fight for a better Europe. Now, one of the things that the Liberal Democrats and the Brexit Party have in common is they have very clear Brexit policies and they've made ground against the two main parties of UK politics, the opposition Labour Party and the ruling Conservative Party. Well, the Labour leader has released a statement and in that statement, Jeremy Corbyn says, these elections became a proxy for a second referendum on Brexit. It will have to go back to the people, whether through a general election or a public vote. Um, Jackie Davis, 
listening to that, that's not quite Jeremy Corbyn saying, let's have a second referendum. No, and many, many times we've thought he's moving towards saying second referendum, only to find there's some weasel words in there. It is very clear he doesn't want one. Uh, he has been fighting against his own party. But what we've heard from a lot of Labour MPs, members of the British Parliament tonight, is this result shows that because we're not clear, because we're not the party of Remain, we have lost out to the Liberal Democrats. Some very dramatic results, particularly in London, where they lost to the Lib Dems. So he'll be under tremendous pressure now to go that Next now, you step. call them weasel words. What he might say, and has said, in fact, is, look, we shouldn't just define our politics by Brexit. We should cater for people as political parties who voted on either sides. But that tactic didn't seem to work. No, the weasel words is my reference to whether he's saying we'll have another referendum or he's saying we won't have another referendum. Every time he's asked, it's like nailing jelly to a wall. It's very unclear. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant about that. But you're quite right. Um, and, but the Labour Party, the thing we have at the moment is our two main parties so divided internally about this issue that this has allowed uh, what has happened. And I think we'll see in the Tory side this huge pressure now to go for no deal, to go for the dramatic exit. And on the Labour side, huge pe pressure to become the party party of Remain and try and take those votes back from the Liberal Democrats. But it's still far from guaranteed whether both parties will go in those directions. We'll Absolutely. see. Now, still keeping us company is Stefan Lina from Carnegie Europe, and we're joined by Rita Sizer, an EU affairs correspondent for Publico, which is a national daily newspaper in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Evening, Rita. Hello. You've been having fun? Yes, very much. <laughs> Where have you spent the evening? Well, I was here since early afternoon, so it's been an all-nighter at the European Parliament. Okay, and uh, before we carry on talking any further, I wonder if we can bring up the Portugal results uh, so that we can discuss them. So here's a projection from Portugal. Seats first. Uh, we have the Socialists coming out on top with 10, the Social Democrats with 6. Um, if we turn that into share of the vote, um, perhaps you could talk us through this a little bit, Rita. What would you pick out as being the most significant? Yeah, well, it, was, uh, a, a, it wasn't a surprise, the result. The uh, governing socialist party has been doing rather well in polls and uh, it was expected to get a good share of the vote. Uh, perhaps a little bit surprising that the uh, centre-right and right, the only right-wing party didn't uh, manage to mm -hmm. uh, hold their last vote, so they went, uh, they, they didn't quite fulfil their expectations. And uh, a newcomer to the European Parliament, which is an MEP uh, elected uh, by the new party of uh, people, animals and nature, so it's a little bit of the green wave uh, that's also being felt in Portugal. Uh, One of the curiosities of Portugal is while countries like Italy and the UK and even Germany to some degree have seen significant political upheaval, that doesn't seem to have arrived no, in Portugal. Yeah, no, Portugal has been sort of an outlier in this election uh, just because the mainstream parties have been uh, holding the fort, so there's no new parties that have been breaking through. So very, it's a very stable vote, I would say. Also, we had the narrative in this election of the big turnout. Portugal was clearly not in that uh, field, so we had a very low turnout. Uh, people might say the weather was too nice and uh, <laughs> folks just decided to go to the beach. But, uh, but yeah, sadly, it's not a very proud Surely moment sunshine in Portugal. Surely sunshine in Portugal doesn't stop people voting. Oh, you have it most well, of the time, that, don't you? We could argue about that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But, but yes, but I think that that's the, the you know, no political party in Portugal is going to be pleased with that uh, factor. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also means that, you know, they, they will, they'll need to gear up and, and and rethink their campaign for the uh, for the general election that's coming up in October. And I wonder what lessons there are, um, just quickly, Stefan, from Portugal and Spain, both of which see social democratic parties, socialist parties, maintaining their vote or increasing their vote, where elsewhere we're seeing social democratic parties, particularly the SPD in Germany, struggling. Well, I, I think there's that quite different cases. I think in Portugal, the Socialist Party was very successful in managing the transition from the austerity policy. Mm -hmm. The recovery was well managed, so people were generally satisfied with the status quo. And that's probably also why they didn't turn out in force. Yes. Whereas uh, 
in, in, in Spain, uh, we just had a change of government. Uh, Sanchez uh, had uh, won the national parliament elections. Uh, it's quite logical that the two, a few weeks later, uh, the Socialist Party would also do well. But right. in this case, of course, the tough transition work was done by by the popular party, and uh, which was the big loser. So it's a completely well, asymmetric situation. If we have political stability in Portugal, I'm not sure that's the phrase I'd use to describe what's happening in the UK at the moment. For those yeah. of you just switching on, let me show you what the BBC is projecting for the European parliamentary results in the UK. Remember, the UK wasn't supposed to be taking part, but Brexit didn't happen on time, and so it had to. The Brexit party has only been around for a few weeks. It won by some distance projected to pick up 29 seats. Liberal Democrats, um, surprising, I think even themselves, judging by the interviews I've done this evening with 16 seats. The Labour Party almost being caught by the Greens, and the Greens are stuck between the official opposition and the, country, and the party which is in power, the Conservatives, who have uh, lost 15 seats, and at the moment are only projected to pick up four. Translate those seats into voter share and you really understand why people are calling this a political earthquake. The Brexit party passed 30 percent, the Liberal Democrats close to 20. Perhaps most astonishing of all, when you put together the two mainstays of UK politics for the last hundred years or more, they currently total 23 percent in a national election. That, I'm pretty sure, has never happened and it's another piece of evidence that Brexit is reshaping UK politics in ways I'm not sure any of us imagined three or four years ago. Well, let me show you what uh, a very senior member of the UK government has been saying. This is Jeremy Hunt tweeting about the outcome. Yes, we knew it was coming but still a painful result. Existential risk to our party unless we come together now and get Brexit done. Well, let's bring in uh, Sir John Curtis from the BBC's new broadcasting house in London, our main newsroom. Uh, Sir John is the UK's leading pollster and he always guides us on important evenings like this. Um, you might look at what Jeremy Hunt is saying, Sir John, and think it might be a bit late to get that message across. It sounds like a lot of people have just turned to Nigel Farage for Brexit certainty. Sure. I mean, the explanation, I think, is fairly straightforward. You have to remember that in the 2017 UK general election, the Conservative Party scooped up a lot of the support that had previously gone to Nigel Farage's old party, that was UKIP, which was the party that was responsible for persuading the UK to have a referendum in the first place. They scooped up that support. They, it did so because essentially these voters thought that by voting Conservative was the best way of ensuring that Brexit happened. Well, now that it's failed to happen on the due deadline of March the 29th, those voters have now gone running back to Nigel Farage's new party, the Brexit Party, essentially expressing their dislike of the fact that we've not exited, not least because we know from polling evidence that at least a half, maybe as many as two thirds, of those who voted leave just think we should just be leaving without a deal if we can't come to an agreement that is satisfactory to the House of Commons and to the European Union, well, let's just get out. And that was the message that Nigel Farage was presenting, and therefore he has indeed managed to get the support of just under a third of those who voted. Um, but frankly, it's just almost the inevitable consequence of the government's failure to deliver on its uh, unique selling proposition, which was to deliver Brexit. Now, Sir John, you can help me out here. I've done an interview with the Brexit Party this evening in which they told me this result is a clear mandate for Brexit to happen, even if it's a no deal. I've done two interviews with the Liberal Democrats who have yep. told me this result is a clear mandate for a second referendum and for the UK to have another vote on whether it would like to remain. Who's right? Neither of them. Um, if we take as our criterion that you need to demonstrate the support of 50% of the electorate, or at least of those voting, neither side comes even close to meeting that criteria. I mean, let's just go through it. There are two parties that were campaigning in favour of leaving without a deal, and we know from polling evidence was overwhelmingly getting their support from Leave voters. One's the Brexit party we've been talking about, the other is UKIP, the Nigel Farage's old party. Between them, 35% of the vote. Now, there were a number of parties campaigning in favour of the idea of a second referendum, um, of which three, were, it's also perfectly clear, were getting their support virtually wholly amongst Remain voters. Those are the Liberal Democrats, 20%, uh, the Greens, 12%, and Change UK, 3%. Total, 
35%. The way in which to understand and read these elections is that essentially what this, uh, the, they have done is to confirm the evidence that first of all, this country is basically evenly divided on the merits of Brexit and how we should be leaving. But secondly, it's also polarized because in this election, voters have either gone for parties of leave without a deal or vote or, or having a second referendum. They have fled away from the parties that were presenting some kind of compromise. That is the two traditional dominant parties of the UK, the Conservatives, the party of government, Labour Party, the party of opposition. They have gone towards the extremes, but that frankly reflects the fact that we are as a country polarized. And the truth is, and I think you know, the message to the European Union is to take away, is that it's going to be very, very difficult for the UK to resolve its Brexit impasse because it is very evenly divided. And I think what's also now going to be clear is that the two largest parties themselves are now going to be much more clearly divided. As I said, they've so far been presenting compromises, albeit different ones. I think there clearly is going to be pressure inside the Labour Party to come up less, unambiguous, less ambiguously in favour of a second referendum because it seems to have lost a lot of voters, Liberal Democrats and to the Greens, because of its ambiguous stance. But equally, the Conservative Party now feels very, very clearly it has to deliver Brexit, it has to deliver Brexit soon, because otherwise, as you said, Jeremy Hunt was pointing out, the party could be heading for serious electoral difficulty. The question is, who is going to win this battle? Can the Conservative Party find a way of getting Brexit through the House of Commons, or can the Labour Party and the, uh, and the parties that are currently in favour of a second referendum find a way of getting a second referendum through the House of Commons? Neither side can be confident of success. Thank you very much. There's Sir John Curtis. And if people are up late here in Brussels or in Strasbourg, people with a, within the European Union's institutions, I suspect none of them will have uh, been calmed at all by Sir John's analysis. The uh, UK is still some distance from resolving whether to do Brexit and how to do Brexit. That one's going to run and run. Of course, the next stage in that process is the Conservatives replacing Theresa May with a new leader, who in turn will also be the new Prime Minister. Well, if it was Nigel Farage's night in the UK, in Italy it was Matteo Salvini's night. The League Party, which he leads, has polled over 30%. He says he intends to spearhead a new alliance of right-wing nationalists across Europe and to bring that alliance into the European Parliament. Here he is speaking after the results came through. It is not only the Lega that is the first in Italy. Marie Le Pen has the first party in France. Nigel Farage is the first party in Britain. So Italy, France, Great Britain. It is the sign of a Europe that is changing, of a Europe tired of the powers of the elites, finance, multinationals, and from tomorrow we will have to redouble our efforts. Stefan Lina and Jackie Davis are still here. Mr. Salvini mentions Nigel Farage a lot. I interviewed him, well, interviewed him. I walked alongside him for 30 seconds or so last weekend, and he made an unprompted reference to Nigel Farage then. He clearly would like the Brexit party to come within that grouping, wouldn't he? Well, he wants it to be as big as possible. Right. Uh, he wants it to have as much influence as possible. Has got a lot but of also, his message is, look, we're on the move, and we're on the move across Europe. Slightly distorted narrative if you actually look at the results across Europe, because yes, we did see the populists do very well in a number of countries. We also saw them do far less well than we expected in some others. So very mixed picture for how they've performed. Overall, there had been a prediction they would make up a third of this parliament. Uh, it looks more like they will be something around a quarter. He is forming a group, the Salvini Alliance, uh, as it's become known already. Um, but if you look at that, it looks as if he'll have about the same number of seats within that group as the Greens will have. So yes, he is right. In some countries, uh, the surge is there, but in others, it really isn't. The most dramatic one for me, Geert Wilders, you'll remember him, yeah, Freedom out. Party in the Netherlands, gone. No seats at all. Danish People Party, wiped out. So we've seen a very mixed picture for populists across Europe. And how do we understand that mixed picture? Is it simply connected to personality? When you have a personality like Mr. Salvini, it works. When you have uh, lesser personality, shall we say, it doesn't carry through? Well, personality is clearly a big factor. With rightist populist parties, they depend on charismatic leaders. If that doesn't exist, then they uh, fall down quite quickly. Uh, but I think 
uh, ultimately it's still 28 parallel national elections. Uh, you have uh, a green <laughs> wave through Europe, but you don't have a rightist populist wave through Europe. Mm. But there it very much depends on the condition from country to country. Generally, I think one could say that uh, uh, in the south they've been doing generally better. In the north, they've been very disappointing compared to uh, most of their protections. And help me understand, however Mr. Salvini brings his coalition together, it will exist and it will be worthy of note, to what degree can he disrupt the work of the European Union and particularly the work in the European Parliament given the numbers we can assume he'll have? Well, we see, still see that the pro-European forces um, have a large majority. If you put all those numbers together, you put the Liberals, you put the Greens with those two main parties, which now no longer run business. So mm. it's a lot more complicated. It used to be very simple. At the centre-right, at the centre-left, nice and simple, <laughs> they would form a nice little club, a grand coalition, and business went very smoothly. It's going to be more disruptive. It's going to be a lot noisier. It's going to resemble more the British House of Commons with a lot of noise and a lot of people shouting at mm. each other whereas European politics is normally a much more civilized affair. Can they really make a difference? I think it will depend how whether they can all come together, which is unlikely for the reason Stefan was just explaining. Uh, and ultimately, that pro-European bloc is very strong still, but they're going to have a bigger task to hold it together. we we'll just pick up on one small issue, or smallish issue, but it, it plays into a broader thing, which is that some of these right-wing nationalist parties want increased national sovereignty. So Salvini says, we should be able to decide our budget. Salvini says, we should be able to control what happens with immigration. We don't want Brussels dictating it all. If you look at some green parties, they're saying, we'd like more localized economies. We don't want the way that we produce food to be exposed to the single market because it's not environmentally sound. And so you have these people coming from quite different parts of the political spectrum, but making a, a similar point, which is, we need more country-level control, that's going to be a live issue, isn't it? Yes, but uh, when you come to the budgetary policies, for instance, uh, here it's very clear that what Salvini says, what he wants, uh, total freedom of action on the budget, is something that his counterparts in the North hate more than anything else. So uh, there's just about, um, there are very few issues, except for migration, where these parties are really united. And I, I think this check is said the key thing is how big are they going to be? And I think probably in the end, instead of three factions, they will have two. Uh, and they will still not be able to really influence the business of the parliament in a significant way. Well, just as you were talking, uh, Beatrice Rios uh, Yages, journalist at Publico Online newspaper in Spain, has just sat down. Hi, Beatrice. Hi. Still going strong? Yeah. It's been a long night. Um, before we talk any further, let's just bring in uh, the projections for how things have gone in Spain. And um, people in Spain could be forgiven of having a little election fatigue. There have been a number of general elections, one very recently. The Socialists were the biggest party in the general election. And as you can see, they're projected to be the biggest party again. Let's have a look at the share. And uh, Beatrice, you can help me out here, actually, as we look at the share. How would you analyze what's happened? Well, when you uh, see as a reflection already of what happened during the general election, so we have the S&D, so the PSOE, going first and much stronger than it was expected in the recent pools. And then we have the Popular Party that has lost quite some representation in the European Parliament compared to the previous um, uh, representation here. And then also you have the rise of the Liberals as well. We have seen other places in Europe. Mm -hmm. with the Ciudadanos um, growing quite a lot. And then Podemos has lost some seats uh, compared to the previous representation in the European Parliament. We have also the rise of the far right, but again, uh, they got much less uh, representation than they expected, mm -hmm. many less seats. Um, let's also bring up, the turn up, bring up the turnout in Spain. Another huge jump. This is on a par with what we've seen in mm -hmm. Poland from 44 to 64, but before everyone in the European Union gets carried away. This is in part because there were also regional and local elections on the same day. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have regional and local elections and I think that had a major impact in the mm. fact that people went and voted for the European elections as well. Now let's talk about the Catalan <laughs> dimension. We had Carlos Puigdemont, uh, the man living in exile here in Brussels at the moment because of those efforts to uh, get Catalonia independence 18 months ago or so. How did the 
uh, these candidates perform? He got elected. Uh, they got two seats at the European Parliament, so they did better than the previous elections when they only had one person. And then the left party that is also independent, these, they got three uh, seats. So again, they improved the representation in the European Parliament with, by one person. And the interesting thing is that, first of all, the two elected MEPs on the side of the Liberals, which is the case of Mr. Puigdemont and Tony Comin, they are both living in exile here in Belgium. So mm. now it's going to be really hard to see what happens because they have to go to Spain to be officially elected MEPs. But of course, if they go to Spain, they're going to be detained. And then the case of the other three is that the lead candidate uh, is Oriol Junqueras, and he is actually in prison yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, so we're going to. In, in reality, will we see either of them? in the European Parliament? It sounds like there are some practical obstacles. Uh, I think it's going to be really hard because we've been looking at, at the European legislation and it's entirely up to the national authorities to decide mm -hmm. on this. And we have seen already that in the case of the Spanish Parliament, in which they some of them were actually already elected, the reaction was to suspend them so they can actually not take over their seats. So I think it's probably going to happen exactly the same here. But of course, we're going to see a lot of fight because they're going to use these as a leverage uh, against the, the Spanish government. So I don't think it's going to be easy anyway. Right. And it's interesting, this, the Spain example, I saw some analysis looking back over the years that the, cl the further away from a general election that the European parliamentary elections happen, the worse it is for the party in power. So if, like the socialists, you've only been in power or you've only won an election just yes. weeks ago, you still be in, should be in good shape. But if, you, if it's two or three or four years, as we've seen with Greece and Syriza, they've, you know... Yeah. Traditionally, these were test elections for the uh, ruling government, uh, how popular they still are. That was the whole point. Yeah. I think what is interesting in these elections, it's gone beyond that. It's much more transnational. In a way, it's more European, but it still has these aspects, of course. But it is also striking that Vox, I think, got 10% yes. of the vote yes. in the general election, and so shortly afterwards go down, drop significantly down to 6%. Absolutely. So that mixed picture that we've been talking about of the populace... So how, do we, how, do we, how do we explain what happened to Vox? Well, Honestly, I have no idea, <laughs> but it's, it's really interesting to see, indeed, because it was just a few weeks ago that they had a major impact in the election. However, it's true that even in that case, the pools were giving them 40 seats in the in the in the Spanish Parliament, and they ended up having only 24. So I think that sometimes we're seeing an overrepresentation of the far right in the pools, and then when we actually go into the elections, people don't vote so much for them. But it's interesting to see that this is happening in Spain. That in the pools we had this, and then once people were to uh, go and voting, then we we don't have so much representation for the far right, which I think it's a good thing anyway. And as we can see, as you're talking on the screen, you know, two of those five parties we're highlighting there will go into the S and D centre-left block. We know that block has aspirations for a number of what Jackie's calling transnational <laughs> policies. It wants new labour laws that are stripped right across the EU. It wants new gender equality legislation stripped across the EU. Is the Spanish electorate open to that? Does it mind if more instructions, more guidance is coming from Brussels? Yeah, I think so. I think the Spanish electoral is rather pro-European, so we're open to that. And we have reflected that in the result of the elections. Actually, uh, the, the, the PSOE, so the, the representative, the Spanish representative in the SND, is now one of the leading parties in the Social Democrats. So I think that's really important. And I think somehow Pedro Sanchez has become a reference at the European level because he's been one of the first socialist leaders to actually do better in the election compared to the trend in Europe, mm -hmm. which was going uh, down. So I think in that sense, they can be even, they, they can take the leadership on this change. And in general, we've seen a lot of these changes in Spain as well. Uh, even before, we have one of the most progressive um, laws in terms of fighting gender violence. We have, we were one of the first uh, European countries in adopting a same-sex marriage as well. So I think we're rather progressive, even we don't have that image from Europe. All right. All three of you, please don't go anywhere. Let me just show everyone watching, whether you're watching in the UK on the BBC News Channel or BBC One or elsewhere around the world on BBC World News. Here we have the projections from the European Union on how the new parliament is going to look. And as we've just been discussing with Beatrice, Stefan and Jackie, the dynamic, the key dynamic that shifted is that light blue block, the EPP, the centre-right block, the red block, the S&D, centre-left block. Both are still the top two, but they've contracted, which means that they're going to have to work with others more regularly. Let me show you uh, how these projections look once we're straight into the numbers. Here you go. 
European People's Party projected to get 179 seats, but significant drop. Socialists, 150, a significant drop. And uh, you can see two groupings that a lot of people are going to be looking very closely at. Aldi on 107, the Greens on 70, both up, and they're going to have a lot of conversations with the Socialists and the EPP about what to do. Let me also show you the, the smaller groupings as well, because this is important to understand all of the dynamics within the European Parliament. So uh, top there, that's the ECR, a group created by David Cameron when he was leader of the Conservatives in the UK. Lots of question marks against that group, not least because the Conservatives in the UK have had such a difficult time. Um, you can see the European United Left down to 38. These are parties like Podemos in Spain, Die Linke in uh, Germany, and also Syriza, which we know has not had a great time in Greece because its leader, Alexis Tsipras, has called a snap election. Well, let's speak next to Ben Haddad, who is... Uh, oh, before, before I bring in Ben Haddad, because I will do that in a moment. Hi, Ben, we can see you. Hold fire a second. Let me just um, show everyone watching the share of the vote as well, because this is also relevant to the conversation I'm about to have with Ben. So the European People's Party now on 22%, the Socialists on 20 So those are the two blocks uh, that will dominate, but not quite as they once did. The reason we're paying a lot of attention to the Liberal bloc, the Yellow bloc, is because Emmanuel Macron is bringing his M MEPs into it. Five years ago, Emmanuel Macron's En Marche wasn't around. And you can see, talk of a green wave, well, up 3%. I don't think we can talk about a green revolution, but significant progress from a number of green parties in a number of different EU member states. Now, Ben, sorry for the false start there. Ben Haddad, Director of the Future Europe Initiative at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. And Ben, you have, good evening to you, by the way. You've worked with Emmanuel Macron's En Marche party. Mr. Macron's talked about a renaissance in Europe. Do you really think the way the vote went in France adds up to that? Well, I mean, tonight is clearly, it's a, it's a victory for the National Front that ends up first. It's not the first time, actually, that Marine Le Pen's movement uh, tops the European election. It already happened last time. She actually has a slightly lower uh, score than last time. But it's also a, a, a pretty strong showing for Emmanuel Macron, who is you know, uh, the, the ruling party of France for the last two years. These, are, these elections are usually a, a punishment for the party in power. The, the most striking aspects of tonight's vote in France is that it confirms uh, the analysis that the traditional right-left divide has been replaced by a, a division shaped by European issues between the far-right National Front and, and the progressive liberals of, of En Marche. The two parties, uh, the two incumbent parties that have governed France for the better uh, part of the last half century, the Socialists and the Republicans, struggle to get 15% combined. There's a complete collapse of traditional parties in France, mm -hmm. and that's been especially confirmed tonight with the uh, very poor showing of the Republicans, a center-right party, who were polling around 13% and only got 8% of the vote. But but hold on a minute. I'll take your point that this could have been worse for Emmanuel Macron. He's had a difficult six to 12 months, and as such, being close to Marine Le Pen is not a disaster. But if you're proposing a European renaissance, you need a bit more than that, don't you? You need a strong backing from your own voters in your own country, and you also need allies elsewhere in the EU who want to pursue integration at the same speed as Emmanuel Macron. I'm not quite seeing evidence of that. Uh, no, and you're right. I mean, this is going to be a, an uphill challenge for Emmanuel Macron in the next few years. Uh, remember, he was elected two years ago with a very strong pro-EU uh, platform. You had uh, his supporters waving European flags at rallies. Uh, and he, he came in with you know, a couple of big speeches advocating for Eurozone integration, for more robust European uh, defense, you know, making a case for European sovereignty. And he struggled to find partners in Europe, first in Germany, obviously, where uh, Chancellor Merkel, I think, was, was not as ambitious in her reform agenda uh, that, as he was on the European level. But also he's alienated uh, various EU partners from Eastern Europe to obviously Italy now where you have populists in, in, in power. So it's going to be a, a, a challenge, especially as uh, Emmanuel Macron's partner, Alde, the, the centrist party of the European Parliament, is only the third party in the European Parliament. So the next few days are going to be critical to know also what kind of alliances he wants to uh, set in motion uh, when it comes to appointing 
the key positions of the European Union, European Commission President, EU Council President. Uh, so it, it is going to be a, a very difficult challenge to uh, push Mr. Macron's agenda on the European stage. Ben, you're talking to us from Washington. Everton, evidently, the relationship between uh, President Trump and the EU has not been particularly smooth. Angela Merkel, Donald Tusk and others have alluded to the fact that the EU can't rely on America as it has done before. But I wonder if you could look at it for this from the American perspective. It's maybe harder to characterize Europe as representing one type of politics anymore, such as the fragmentation we've seen this evening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see lots of different trends. Uh, some of them are confirmed. There's, there has been a rise of populist movements. Uh, you know, maybe not as spectacular as some of the polls suggested, but clearly it's a, it's a trend that we've seen going in Europe over the last few years. But m more uh, importantly, as, as you've noted, I mean, the, the political environment is, is really scattered. The, the two parties, the EPP and the Socialists, that used to share power in the European Parliament and thus share uh, key positions in the Commission, the Council, uh, now, you know, cannot uh, form that kind of a majority. So, uh, you know, I think coming, seeing this from Washington, there's going to be a lot of uh, questions about the EU's ability to uh, pass an agenda, to uh, be, be governed and do more than just muddle through in the next few years, especially when you have so many challenges, and the international environment being one of them, having a, a president of the United States that has declared that EU was a foe, that has imposed tariffs on the European Union clearly necessitates, I think, a more autonomous and robust EU in this time. Ben, thank you very much indeed for your time. There's Ben Haddad live with us from Washington, D.C., giving us his analysis of the situation through the prism of Emmanuel Macron's En Marche party, which he worked with for a time. You'll keep hearing references to how well the Greens have done. Let me put some numbers behind those kind of phrases. First of all, this is in Germany. Um, we saw evidence of this in the polling in the last couple of weeks that the Greens could do well, and they've delivered on that polling, doubling their vote on where they were five years ago. But it's not just about Germany. This is what happened in Ireland. The Green Party jumping from below 5% to 15%. And unsurprisingly, Greens are getting excited. Caroline Lucas is the most high-profile Green Party politician in the UK, and she's been tweeting about what she's seeing playing out in the European Parliament. She says, it's looking like a great night for the Greens. We're part of the green wave sweeping across the EU, with the Green Group in Parliament looking likely to be the largest ever. Um, let's just talk with Beatrice, Stefan, and, and Jackie about this. I, I mean, I don't mean to, you know, they've clearly had a very good evening, but they've upped their share of the vote by, I think, 3%. I don't know, if, does that warrant green wave as a description? Well, I think it does in the countries where the result has been dramatic. Right. Uh, and we've seen it, as you cited, some of those numbers So a green there. wave in Germany, but perhaps seen, not across Exactly. It has not had the ripples everywhere. Uh, they are up. They were up significantly in France. They were up significantly in a number of countries, not just the ones you mentioned. But we have a, an east-west divide here. They've done well in Western Europe, mm. they don't do well, and they still don't do well in Eastern Europe. So the, we can't say there's been a surge across uh, the plane, but where they are disrupting the landscape, they are making a big difference to domestic politics in a number of countries. So maybe it's a series of concentric waves, not one big, enormous <laughs> surge. I don't know what you think. Green concentric <laughs> waves. There's a thought for the middle of it's the night in Brussels. It's a bit complicated, isn't it? Yeah. I think that big handicap is that they're not in government anywhere. Hmm? And uh, clearly the European Council and the Councillor is still not, it's equally important in some respects, more important than the European Parliament. Uh, and as long as they don't break through that glass roof. Uh, uh, and I so just to that explain that, that point, the European Council different. represents the leaders from all the EU member states, no. and you're saying the Green Party is not represented in those at discussions. All, at yeah. all. Uh, and, and that is a big handicap for them. But they're leaders in the sense of, of you know, spiritual leaders, I would say. It, it's clearly the awareness that this is a hugely important topic. Uh, you will see many mainstream uh, parties suddenly turning a little bit green because they see the necessity. Germany is now getting out of coal, uh, and I think this is a re reaction to, to the, this wave uh, happening. There's another graph I saw earlier which analyzed how young voters in Germany went and the Green Party was like this and yes. all of the other parties yes, were absolutely. much, much smaller. So your point would be they'll influence the policies of all 
the mainstream parties. Absolutely. I, I think this is not going to go away. I think no. climate change, unfortunately, is not going to go away. And this is becoming more and more important, I think, month after month after month, mm -hmm. and will rise on the European agenda. And I think the smart thing for the next commission is to make this a centerpiece of that program. Uh, and this could be sort of the driver that can actually make a lot of other reforms in other areas possible that uh, by themselves don't have sufficient momentum behind them. But I just want to explain to everyone watching who doesn't follow Brussels incredibly closely, when you say the European Commission could make it the centre of its agenda, who sets that? The president, the new president of the Commission would be the person to do that? Absolutely. And will define his or her priorities for the next five years and, and come up with a leitmotif, a sort of, this is the sort of commission we want to right. be. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, when he became commission president, uh, described this as the last chance saloon, effectively, for reconnecting with voters. He will say the turnout today shows they did that. He made the economy very central because it was after the economic crisis. So yes, the executive arm, the commission, will now, once it has a new president, set out its agenda. But of course, it's very much driven by the leaders sitting around the table, the 28 leaders, the Prime Ministers, and as you're saying, if there isn't a green there, uh, it'll be a question of the degree to which mainstream parties say, okay, the lesson of these elections for us is we need to do They're more They're all going to be trying area. to out-green each other, exactly, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. How, how do green politics fit into Spain? Well, we don't have a large representation. What I wanted to say is that I completely agree with your assessment, but I also think it's a problem in the south of Europe. We don't have a, a big representation neither in Portugal, Spain, Greece, and Italy. And then I also think that what you mentioned before, the point you made about the youth people, I think that that's really important. I think we're seeing a generation and generational dividing here, and I think that eventually that's going to come up because these people are going to grow up and keep on voting for these political parties. So this is something that's going to stay there also because the problems of the climate change are not going to disappear. On the, on the contrary, they're going to get worse. So I think it's the kind of thing that it might not necessarily be so important now, although I do believe that if eventually the parliament agrees on a wider coalition going together uh, from the socialists to the liberals to the greens, then they're going to shape the agenda in a way. But also I think in the future we're going to see more and more green political parties getting into power and eventually arriving to the European Council. Well, if these were perhaps more normal times in UK politics, the fact that the Greens have come forth and gone well past 10% would be a story in itself. As you're about to see from the front pages of the newspapers, the Greens aren't really getting a look in because of what's happened with the projected result in the UK. Let's start with the Daily Express. Now give us the Brexit we voted for. The Express has been consistently for Nigel Farage and for Brexit for a number of years, so no surprise to see uh, the Brexit Party leader on the front page. The Daily Telegraph, it always follows the Conservative Party particularly closely and it describes this as humiliation for Tories as Farage storms EU poll. Look at those bullet points. Brexit Party surges across the country, worst ever result for Conservatives. Lib Dems gain as Britain is polarised. And that word polarised is directly in line with what Sir John Curtis, the UK's top pollster, was telling us a few minutes ago on this programme. Next we have the I. Let's see how it's covering the story. Voters turn against Tories and Labour. It's playing it relatively straight. And this is the Times, <laughs> a, part, a paper which would prefer that Brexit doesn't happen. It says Farage surge sends main parties into meltdown. Um, Naomi Grimley has been helping me over the last few hours from the BBC's newsroom in London. I mean, there's no doubting, Naomi, this is dire for both of the big parties. I guess the question is what they do about it. Indeed, and um, this result will be particularly interesting when it comes to the Conservative leadership election, which of course is happening because of Theresa May's resignation last week. Now, uh, if you look at what's happened to the Conservative Party, there's been this huge collapse. It's the worst result in their history since 1834, if you want the exact date. Uh, in fact, that was when they were first founded, so it's their worst result full stop. And that's why I think we will see more of the leadership candidates uh, tomorrow arguing that uh, that the party needs to take a much tougher line when it comes to Brexit. Let me read you a line from Boris Johnson's uh, op opinion piece in the Daily Telegraph tomorrow. He says, if we go on like this, we'll be fired. So he clearly feels, fears that the uh, May premiership is costing the Conservative Party key votes at the expense, uh, or rather because of the Brexit party.
Now let's talk about the Brexit party, Naomi. When Nigel Farage was leader of the UK Independence Party five years ago, he won the European parliamentary elections then, but wasn't able to turn that into significant representation in Westminster. What's the analysis around whether Mr Farage with the Brexit party can not just influence, but actually see some power within the Commons? Well, as you point out, European elections are very different from Westminster elections because they're fought on a different electoral system. First past the post, which is how Westminster elections are fought, make it much harder for the smaller parties to break through. However, the performance tonight does suggest that something has shifted in British politics. Uh, they have won all the EU seats bar one of those declared so far. Of course, that other one went to the Liberal Democrats in London. So uh, if they correctly fielded candidates at a Westminster le election, they might not uh, see the same kind of results, but they would nevertheless, no doubt, make some headway in getting representation in a UK parliament. Uh, of course, the opposition parties will be hoping that they can keep their preeminence in a Westminster election because otherwise uh, they clearly would be in deep, deep trouble of historic mm. proportions. Uh, judging by what Sir John Curtis was telling me a little while ago, Naomi, plenty of Labour voters switched to the Lib Dems to make their feelings on Brexit very clear. Have we heard from the Labour leadership about whether it's listening? Well, Jeremy Corbyn did tweet a statement a couple of hours ago saying that his party was going to reflect on those results. He also uh, reiterated that he believes uh, the Brexit decision has to go back to the people, though clearly he won't actually say uh, that he believes that should be in the form of a second referendum. He says either an election or a second referendum. The difficulty for Labour is this. Yes, they've hemorrhaged votes to the Liberal Democrats in the south of England. But if you look at some of the northern results, it's a different picture. They've actually lost votes to the Brexit party. And that's why some MPs, Labour MPs like Lisa Nandy, have been tweeting that there is a different narrative there and that the party still needs to listen to those leave-leaning constituencies like hers in Wigan. Naomi, thank you very much indeed. These are going to be crucial moments for both the Tories and the Labour Party. We shall have to see what conclusions they draw from these disappointing election results. Remember, if you want particular analysis of the UK results, you can get that through the BBC News Live page, which is on bbc.com slash news and the BBC News app. Well, where are we? We're coming up to 10 to 4 in the morning here in Brussels. For the last six hours, this extraordinary exercise in democracy has been delivering us results from across the EU, all of its 28 member states. Let's try and pull together some of the most significant outcomes that we've seen. And we're going to start with turnout, a story in itself, not just which way people voted, but just the fact they voted in far greater numbers, up almost 10%. And you can see how this translated into results in Germany. The biggest single block of MEPs comes from Germany, over 90 of them, that's connected to population. Germany's population is the biggest of all EU member states. The Christian Democrats and the CSU top, but not top in the way they'd want to be. And the Greens grabbing the headlines through 20%. Social Democrats, they knew it was going to be bad. They perhaps hoped it wouldn't be that bad, but the SPD in Germany has a lot of thinking to do if it's to work its way back into a significant position in German politics. Next, let's look at Greece. We're going to have a snap election in Greece because of the figures I'm about to show you. New democracy giving itself a nine-point lead over Syriza, which has been in a minority government. Syriza is led by the Prime Minister elected Tsipras. He didn't take too long to react to these figures. This is what he said. <laughs> Right after the second round of local government elections on the 2nd of June, I will immediately ask the president to declare national elections. In the end, the Greek people will be the only ones to make the final decision. In France, we had two big personalities who effectively turned it into a political duel. Marine Le Pen versus the president, Emmanuel Macron, and Marine Le Pen's national rally pipped it two percentage points ahead of En Marche, though given the problems President Macron's had in the last six, 12 months, that won't be considered a disaster by his supporters. Marine Le Pen came out on top in France. Her ally, Matteo Salvini, and his League party came out on top 
in Italy. And he spoke not long after those results were released. It is not only the Lega that is the first in Italy. Marie Le Pen has the first party in France. Nigel Farage is the first party in Britain. So Italy, France, Great Britain. It is the sign of a Europe that is changing, of a Europe tired of the powers of the elites, finance, multinationals, and from tomorrow we will have to redouble our efforts. And there's no harm in looking at the UK results several times over just to be sure that you've seen it right because these are results the like of which we have never seen before. The projection is the Brexit party, which has existed for a few weeks, led by Nigel Farage, 32%. Remember, its policy is the UK has to do Brexit by the end of October. And if it's a no-deal Brexit, so be it. The Liberal Democrats, I think, have surprised even themselves, judging by the Lib Dems we've spoken to in the last few hours, 19%. The opposition Labour Party on 14%. The Greens, they're above the ruling Conservative Party on 9%. And I just want to work through all of the other parties to give you an idea of how this is shaped up in the UK because they have the Scottish National Party on 3%, Clyde Cymru from Wales on 2 Both of those sit with the Green Bloc, by the way, in the European Parliament. Sinn Féin and the DUP, 1% each from Northern Ireland. And this is what Nigel Farage has been saying about coming first. He did it last time, 2014. It was with UKIP. This time round, it's with the Brexit party. Never before in British politics has a party just six weeks old won a national election. If Britain does not leave the European Union on the 31st of October, these results will be repeated at a general election. Although, of course, at the moment, there's no general election scheduled in the UK in the near future. And one last time, this is the European Union's projections of what the Parliament is going to look like. There are lots of question marks around the ENF. That's the block which Marine Le Pen and Matteo Salvini sit in. Mr. Salvini wants to create a new block. Questions too around the EFDD, which has contained the UK Independence Party, but its representation is right down. The ECR, a Eurosceptic group created by the Conservatives in the UK, question marks there too because of the Tories and their poor performance. But on the left-hand side of the equation, the EPP, the centre-right bloc, still the biggest but smaller. The S&D, the left bloc, left of centre bloc, still the second biggest but smaller. And the Greens and the Liberals are up, which means those four in particular are going to be having lots of conversations. Um, it's been a long night. Uh, Jackie, Beatrice, Stefan, thank you very much indeed for your company. Let's just step back here and think about the broader question of European politics. I've been traveling around Europe the last 10 days. People keep telling me it's just 28 domestic elections which happen to add up to a parliament. That seemed to be the consensus. Now we've seen the results. Now we've seen people reacting, perhaps in ways we haven't done before. Can we start talking about European politics in a way that we haven't done before? I think the dividing line between European politics and national politics is uh, fading away, basically. This is becoming one big thing with mutual interface, basically, and mm -hmm. uh, influencing each other very much. I, I think the main trend that I take away from this is fragmentation and volatility, mm -hmm. because the old establishment that owned this place mm -hmm. for decades is gone out of business. Uh, it's going to be a lot more interesting and more creative in terms of politics, and you but don't, also sometimes more difficult. And you don't think it's coming back? Uh, I don't think it's coming no. back. I think there is the deeper changes here that has to do with the media scene. It has to do with the uh, lack of collective identities when workers used to work for union people and business people, for business people. Uh, people now are much more mobile. Mm -hmm. They are less obedient. They are much more sort of active in, in framing their own politics. So this is going to be the trend for the future. What about you, Beatrice? I think that in a way, the fact that the turnout was one of the highest in the past 20 years is also a reflection that the Europeans have understood that there are issues that we have to work out together. I think migration, climate change, it's social Europe are things that now Europeans have in mind. And I think they have go to the, to the polls and they have proved that by voting for new political parties that have a different agenda. And I think that the fact that we have a fragmented parliament might be good news because that, that would mean that we will have different parties represented that now have to work together. And maybe we can have a new Europe in which we are 
have we have everybody represented in a way. I still fundamentally feel it's 28 national elections uh, because when we look at the reasons behind what has happened in each country, there are very clearly national factors that have played in each case. But I think you're right, those connections between what happens in one country and how it translates, and the sheer fact, Ross, that we have been here in the Parliament tonight, 1,300 journalists covering 28 countries, all eyes in every country in Europe, on the result of an election on the same day, on many of the same issues. Uh, something has changed. I'm not sure it's uh, uh, seismic yet, but we are on the move. Thank you to all of you for keeping me company. It's been a long night, but it's been a fascinating one. Thank you very much to Jackie, you, Stefan, and Beatrice. So there you go. That's the end of this BBC World News election special. The mainstream is under pressure in the European Parliament. They'll have to work across various blocks to get legislation through. And really, it's been a pivotal night for European politics, for the European Union and for its 28 EU member states. Uh, sincere thanks to the team here in Brussels and in London. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hello, it wouldn't be a bank holiday weekend without some rain around. Unfortunately, those of us who need it most have actually seen very little, and Sussex was one of the counties which avoided most of the showers on Sunday. By contrast, we've had a lot of rain across parts of Scotland, particularly Highland and Aberdeenshire, as much as 30 millimetres, well over an inch in just 24 hours. Now, this frontal system lingers as we go into bank holiday Monday across Scotland, so that's going to keep further rain going chiefly across the central belt, southern Scotland, down into parts of the far north of England and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a day of sunny spells and scattered showers, but the showers most frequent across northwest and southwest England and Wales. A brisk west or northwesterly wind will push them a little bit further into the Midlands, some southern counties of England, but uh, fewer showers across East Anglia and southeast England. More in the way of sunshine here, so that means higher temperatures, 18 or 19 Celsius, mid to high teens for most, but just 9 or 10 Celsius for the far north of Scotland. We'll keep some showers going through the evening. They will tend to fade, but some showery rain reforming across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales, eastern Scotland, elsewhere a mixture of variable cloud and clear spells. But it will be a cooler night compared to the nights we had through the bank holiday weekend. So on into Tuesday, we've still got this little frontal system diving its way southwards, still generating showers. The winds will be lighter. But they are coming from the north or the northwest, so the cool air that we've been seeing across Scotland will start to dig its way a little bit further southwards. A cool start to Tuesday for many. There'll be some bright or sunny spells, but on Tuesday, quite a few showers developing across central and eastern areas. The best chance for East Anglia and South East England to see some decent rain will be from these showers, but they are going to be somewhat hit and miss. Fewer showers further west, best of the sunshine here. Temperatures for most in the mid-teens, maybe 17 or 18 Celsius across southern England where we get any sunshine. Into Wednesday, we've got this area of high pressure building from the southwest, so that's going to kill off most of the showers across England and Wales. Should be a dry and fine day here. Still some showers to talk about, chiefly across Northern Ireland and the western side of Scotland. After a sunny start for much of the UK, the cloud will build, but for much of England, Wales and southern Scotland, it should be mainly dry. Temperatures typically, again, in the mid-teens, 17 or 18 Celsius further south. So to sum up the week ahead, it's going to be feeling cooler for a time. There will be some rain, but for those who need it most, there may not be very much. Bye-bye. In a world of complex global news stories, we'll sift through the information to bring you what matters most. And with reaction and reporting in real time, our immigration laws are a laughing stock all over the world. You'll know what's happening around the world as we do. And that these new measures won't actually stop Venezuelans coming over. It will just make the migrant crisis worse. Whatever the story, we'll piece it together on Outside Source. Join me, Ros Atkins, Monday to Thursday at 9 on the BBC News Channel.
welcome to BBC News, broadcasting to viewers in North America and around the globe. I'm Duncan Golastani. Our main story this hour, centrist parties are the big losers in the European elections with the highest voter turnout in 20 years. Smaller parties make big gains. In Germany, the Greens become the second largest party. The far right comes fourth and the established parties do badly. The heutigen Prognosen, the Today's results are telling us that the middle, the democratic centre that is willing to compromise, has been weakened through this election. In France, the far-right national rally led by Marine Le Pen came just ahead of the En Marche party of President Emmanuel Macron. In the UK, the Brexit party wins most seats, but pro-Remain parties also make big gains. And in Greece, the government fares so badly, the Prime Minister calls a snap general election. Hello, welcome to the programme. Over the next hour, we'll bring you right up to date with all that's happened in the European elections. A huge democratic exercise across 28 nations that has seen some quite fascinating trends. Tells us as much about attitudes towards the union as it does about what is going on in each of those countries. So let's take a look at how the new parliament might look. Here is the projection. If you see there that large slice of blue, that is the European People's Party, still the largest party, but a much smaller slice. And then over there on the left, the SND, the Socialists and Democrat Party, the centre-left grouping, uh, again, a large party, but with reduced seats. And the key thing there to notice is that they might be the two large parties, but they have lost their overall majority if the if the projections are correct. And that will mean some very interesting power play going on in Brussels in the coming months. If we take a look at turnouts, this will be heartening to officials uh, in the EU because it is now just over 51%, up from 42.6% in 2014 and reverses a decline over the last few decades. Turnout there at 51%. It has been a good night for rightist groups and populist parties uh, across the EU and also uh, for the Greens. Let's get an update on the bigger picture now with Ramzan Karmali. Over 200 million people have cast their votes in 28 countries across the European Union. That's a turnout of 51%, the highest in 20 years. Their verdict? Well, it's been a bad night for the mainstream parties that currently make up the coalition within the European Parliament. The leader of the Christian Democrats in Germany, the party of the current Chancellor Angela Merkel, conceded that her party hadn't done enough to persuade voters to stick with them. We haven't been dynamic. We have to concede that during our time in government, we haven't given the decisive answers that the people in Germany expect of us. The mainstream parties that make up a coalition in the 751-seat parliament looks to be lost. The centre-right bloc, in light blue, still looks like it will have the most seats. Its coalition partner, the Socialists in red, will still be in second. Both the Liberals and the Greens have made significant gains and perhaps will now be part of a future coalition. Populist parties have gained ground in a number of countries, including France, where Marine Le Pen won her head-to-head -head battle with President Macron. Her National Rally Party looks to have edged out en marche. I see in this a victory of the people who have taken power back tonight with fierceness and dignity. We welcome these results with joy and the National Rally's name has never been more fitting. Whether you voted with your heart or your reason, be assured that a vote for the National Rally is a vote for France and for the people. The Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras called for an early general election after his Conservative rival New Democracy Party easily won. Perhaps the biggest winner amongst the nationalist parties, though, was in Italy, where Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini's far-right league 
is projected to beat the Democratic Party into second place. He wants to form a new alliance of right-wing nationalists across Europe. In the UK, it was a vote that wasn't supposed to take place for a parliament the British public have already voted to leave in 2016. And there's still a small chance that elected MEPs may not even take up their seats on July the 2nd, if Britain does leave before then. It's going to be quite a big win for the Brexit party, yeah. Which I'm pleased about. Nigel Farage and his newly formed Brexit party is set to win ahead of the pro-Remain Liberal Democrats. Though the big story is how the two dominant parties, the Conservatives and Labour, saw their share of the vote capitulate. Between them, they couldn't even secure a quarter of all votes. There'll be hardly any time before the next bit of important business for the EU. Leaders have been invited to a summit on Tuesday to decide who will get the top jobs, including the presidencies of the Council and the Commission. Ramzan Karamali, BBC News. Let's go straight to Brussels then and speak to our correspondent there, Adam Fleming. So, Adam, lots of results. What's your big takeaway then from the last few hours? Well, I'm based here in Brussels. I cover the EU institutions. And so I'm looking at it from the perspective of, of how that will change. And what has happened here in the European Parliament tonight is that the stranglehold, the big centre-left and centre-right political groups here uh, have had on the business of the European Parliament for decades and decades and decades has disappeared. Between them, the centre-left and the centre-right across Europe do not have enough seats in the European Parliament to control the agenda and to guarantee that legislation will get through. To do that, the, uh, they will have to rely on support from the Greens and from the much larger Liberal group now as well, uh, which includes uh, Emmanuel Macron's En Marche MPs, and the Greens include lots of extra Green MEPs that have been elected tonight in places like Germany as part of something they're calling the Green Wave. So over the next couple of days, it would be really intriguing to see, do those four big pro-European groups form a block where they all work together? Does that involve some kind of coalition agreement or some kind of roadmap for the next five years of EU business? But then you think, as soon as the U groups in the European Parliament start building a roadmap or deciding the direction of the EU, they're going to come in conflict with EU leaders, the leaders, the prime ministers, presidents and chancellors of the member states, who will potentially see that as a big power grab. And the other thing that's going to unfold out here in Brussels in the next day or two is kick-starting the process for selecting and appointing those top jobs. A new president of the European Commission, a new foreign policy chief, because the treaties say those appointments are meant to reflect the results of the European Parliament elections. Now, is it the European Parliament that is going to call the shots on those appointments, or will it be the presidents and the leaders of the member states that do that? So I think I can fairly summarise that as lots to do and lots of uncertainty then, Adam. Let's drill down a bit into it. And the leader of the uh, European People's Party said earlier that there is now a shrinking centre. If, they, if a message is being sent to Brussels, do you think it's a message that they will respond to? Well, I mean, they don't have a lot of choice because if you look at how the, the seats are carved out in the European Parliament, the majority they're going to have now will be, as I said, made up of the centre-right, the centre-left, the Liberals and the Greens. And they're all broadly on the same page when it comes to being pro-European, although you get some people who are much more in favour of a bit more Europe um, and some people who are maybe a bit more pragmatic. So I think if you voted for somebody who is protesting, if you're somebody who doesn't want more Europe or is very anti the European project and you're probably going to be disappointed because I predict the direction of this place is going to still be broadly pro-EU and the reason that has happened is that this big populist surge or nationalist surge or whatever you want to call it, the labels are quite confusing and not particularly accurate has not really materialised Okay, in places like Italy, Matteo Salvini's League Party did incredibly well. In places like France, Marine Le Pen's national rally came first, but they did just as well as they did last time. But then in other countries like Denmark, uh, then the, the populists and the anti-European parties did not do very well. So I think maybe if you're looking at the, the rise of populism, you're not really looking at a rise, you're looking at a kind of net result that is the same as the last time the elections were held in 2014. And I think that is one of the big surprises tonight. The populists, the opponents of the EU, are not going to be marching on the European Parliament with flaming torches to tear it down because they just haven't done as well as some people thought and some people feared. 
it sounds a bit like uh, everyone can look in there and find the story uh, that they want to find, which I imagine lots of politicians will be doing in the coming days. Let's talk about the green parties, the green surge, the green wave that they themselves are calling it. Will they be now able to influence legislation in a much bigger way? Again, that's really hard to say, and I think we need to look at the next couple of days and find out what is this roadmap or coalition agreement that the big pro-European blocs actually managed to coalesce around. We've already heard representatives of the Green Party saying that one of the big areas they want to influence things on is, is trade deals that the EU does in future, and they will insist that there is a big green environmental climate component in every trade deal that the EU does in future. But they're knocking at an open door there because actually lots of the other parties saw the rise of the green agenda and the fact that, that green environmental issues and climate issues were playing a big part in these elections. And you have heard lots of other parties saying that they're going to address that too. Um, I think we can probably put some of the um, rise of the green parties on the shoulders of that young Swedish climate activist, Greta Thunberg. Her movement to get kids, school students, to skive off school and go on strike uh, every Friday for the last few months has had a real impact. And uh, the, the, in terms of the, the, when you ask people across Europe what one of their priorities were going to be, the environment has shot up in the last couple of months. Of course, that might be a product of the fact that lots of the big problems that the EU has had in the last few years, dealing with migration, dealing with the Eurozone crisis and the sovereign debt crisis, those things have massively died away now to be replaced by other issues. And one of those big issues is the environment. And in terms of um, the shifting numbers uh, for the main groupings, Adam, what does this mean now for the big jobs in Brussels, which will be up for grabs? I think there's now going to be a massive tussle between the European Parliament, which will come to its interpretation of what these results mean, and whether this has the centre-right done well enough, for example, that their candidate, Manfred Weber from Germany, now has the best claim for the top job, or is it Franz Timmermans, who is the lead candidate for the centre-left? He personally did quite well in his home country, the Netherlands. He has been trying very hard to build a coalition of progressive parties. So not just the centre-left, but the Greens and the Liberals. Do they throw their weight behind him? And actually, Parliament's position is that he's got the better chance of, um, of, of leading the commission. He's got the best call on that job. Or... On Tuesday, tomorrow, there is a meeting of EU leaders, a special summit, where they will come to their own interpretation of what these results mean and what it means for the process for appointing the President of the Commission and a foreign policy chief, and then further down the line, the President of the European Council. So I think the next couple of days, we're going to see a massive arms race between this place, the European Parliament, and the leaders of the individual countries over who gets to decide who gets those top jobs. And they are important jobs. They may not be household names in, across the EU amongst members of the public, but the person who is in charge of the European Commission and the person who chairs the summits of the EU leaders has a massive influence on daily life here in Brussels and the EU institutions. All right, plenty to keep you busy in the coming hours and days. Adam, thank you very much for the moment. Though. Adam Fleming there, our correspondent in Brussels. So we were just talking about the uh, lack of an overall majority for the two uh, centre parties. Well, the European Commission Vice President for Jobs, Growth, Investment and Competitiveness and former Prime Minister of Finland, Jyrki Keitanen, spoke to Ross Atkins about what it might mean for centrist parties in the future. It's pretty clear that both EPP and Social, Socialist Group have lost some seats, but if looking at uh, from the other dimension, it's also clear that pro-European forces have won the elections. So the, in order to form a coalition, pro-European coalition, there must be more parties, for instance, EPP, Socialist, ALDE and, and, and Greens, for instance. So I'm relieved because um, populists and nationalists got, uh, uh, got less more seats than we expected. But do you think these results also emphasize that perhaps centrist parties like yours have not given voters the solutions to the problems they care about most, whether that's immigration or climate change? 
this may be the, may be the case. So uh, centrist parties must uh, make sure that their voice is heard and the messages are clear. But um, the rise of nationalism has also created a pushback effect. So uh, I'm very happy that the turnout this time around was higher than, than before and uh, also that pro-European forces uh, will form a overwhelming majority in the European Parliament. So this is a good news. Mr. Katainen, you'll sometimes hear critics say these elections are really just 28 national elections, that there's nothing coherent about them at a European level. Do you think now that we're seeing these results coming in, we can talk about a European politics existing? Well, this time around, I guess it was uh, these elections were more European elections than than previous European parliamentary elections, because um, because of the rise of nationalism and populism, many people thought that uh, it's not right. We have to push back. We have to make sure that uh, European issue, European Union, and European integration is taken forward. And for instance, the, the topics like climate change, circular economy, security and defense, artificial intelligence, migration, many people understand that those are too big to solve in national level and we need more, uh, we need a better European Union and we need more effective European Union. So, um, so uh, the result where pro-European forces uh, are form or are getting a comfortable nature in the European Parliament tells quite clearly that people were worried about the current uh, development. That was Yoki Katerman speaking to my colleague Ros Atkins a little while ago. Let's go to Italy, where the far-right League Party of Interior Minister Matteo Salvini won the most votes. They had a good night there. They're projected to get 28 seats. That's up from 23. Uh, their coalition partners, the Five Star Group, uh, 14 down three, and that is likely to cause some problems in that coalition there in Italy. And you can see the other groups there uh, as well. Let's go on to the share, though, because this is particularly interesting. Uh, the League got 34%. Compare that to 2014 when they got 6.2%. And then if you go down to, you see, again, their coalition partners, Five Star, they got 17%. And that's an almost exact inversion of how the coalition partners performed in last year's uh, general election. So that is going to cause some tensions in that coalition government in Italy. We'll get some analysis on that in just a moment. But first, let's hear from Matteo Salvini, leader of the League Party. Non solo la Lega primo partito in Italia, it is not only the Lega that is the first in Italy. Marie Le Pen has the first party in France. Nigel Farage is the first party in Britain. So Italy, France, Great Britain. It is the sign of a Europe that is changing, of a Europe tired of the powers of the elites, finance, multinationals, and from tomorrow we will have to redouble our efforts. Matteo Salvini there. Let's go to Rome and speak to Nula McGovern, who is tracking all of this for us. Hello, Nula. So it was Matteo Salvini's night, wasn't it? Well, it is. I mean, we're looking at those figures. You were going through them there, Duncan. And um, I think some people are taking a look at that 33.6% and wondering exactly what can Matteo Salvini do with that number. I'm terribly sorry, Nula. We've just got a few sound problems of the line to you there in Rome. We'll come back to you in a moment. So let's cross over the continent and go to Germany. And it was a very good election there for the Greens, as we mentioned earlier. Let's take a look. The Greens there projected to get uh, 21 seats. That's up 10, uh, mainly at the expense of the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats. And then do we have the share? And there we can see the share there, the Greens, 21% up 10%. The Greens doing very well across the continent in Denmark, in the UK, uh, but particularly in Germany. Scar Keller is a German MEP and co-founder of the European Green Bloc, and she's been speaking to my colleague, Ros Atkins. 
We're very thankful for the trust that the voters all over Europe have put into the Green Party. And of course, for us, this is now a big task and also a big responsibility to put our demands into practice when it comes to climate um, protection, but also when it comes to making sure that the European Union becomes a social union. Now, those two big centrist blocs, the EPP and the S&D, are going to want to talk to you because they may need you in order to have a functioning majority. What do you want in return for voting with them on occasions? Well, for us it's very clear. We are the Greens and we want to put green policies into place. So um, we want to vote for policies of climate protection. We want to make sure we create a social Europe which is with social protection for everyone, social rights for everyone. And also we want to make sure that the rule of law and civil liberties are protected everywhere in the European Union, also for example in Hungary. So we're going to vote for green policies. Now, some people are sceptical of the European Parliament's ability to influence the other institutions of the European Union, in particular the Council and the Commission. Do you believe from your position within the Parliament you can do that? Yes, of course, because the Parliament is the normal co-legislator, so together with the, the Council, so the Member States, we're together doing the legislation, so no one can decide anything without the European Parliament, so we have a strong voice as Parliament, and we also now have a very strong voice for climate protection, for biodiversity protection, and we're going to use that voice. That was Scar Keller just coming off the back of us talking about how well the Greens did uh, in Germany and that was largely at the expense of Chancellor Angela Merkel's centre-right Christian Democrats. They had their worst ever performance uh, in the European elections, so uh, a difficult night for them. Let's go over to France. Marine Le Pen's far-right national rally finished ahead of President Macron's on Marsh Party. Le Pen lost out to Macron in a bitter presidential contest in 2017. Now she's calling for the head of state to dissolve the parliament and call new elections, a proposal that was immediately rejected by the government. I see in this a victory of the people who have taken power back tonight with fierceness and dignity. We welcome these results with joy, and the national rally's name has never been more fitting. Whether you voted with your heart or your reason, be assured that a vote for the national rally is a vote for France and for the people. Let's go to Greece, uh, where it was a difficult night for the Prime Minister, Alexis Tsipras, uh, and his party, so difficult that he has now called for a general election. Let's take a listen to him speaking earlier. Right after the second round of local government elections on the 2nd of June, I will immediately ask the president to declare national elections. In the end, the Greek people will be the only ones to make the final decision. Now, the UK wasn't supposed to be taking part in these elections, but divisions over a delayed Brexit have deepened, and it looks like that may have had an impact at the ballot box. Let's take a look. Nigel Farage's new Brexit party, formed just six weeks ago, has claimed victory in nine of the 11 regions that have declared so far. While well, meanwhile, support for the ruling Conservatives uh, has dropped considerably, as well as for the opposition Labour Party, uh, highlighting their difficult stances on Brexit. We're going to talk about that in a moment, but first let's hear from Mr Farage. The intelligence I get is that the Brexit Party is doing pretty well, the Lib Dems clearly on the Remain side are doing reasonably well, uh, but it, you know, it looks like it looks like there's going to be quite a big win for the Brexit Party, yeah. which I'm pleased about. So that was Nigel Farage uh, speaking earlier. Well, let's speak to our correspondent, Naomi Grimley, who you can see joins me uh, in the studio here. A huge night for him. Unbelievable that the Brexit party was formed so recently. Indeed. I mean, the Conservatives were bracing themselves for terrible results, but it really is quite extraordinary. When you look at London, for example, they only polled 8% of the votes, the Conservatives. They're, they've gone down from 19 MEPs to 3 MEPs, and they're frankly looking at the worst results since they were founded in the early 1830s. So that's the governing Conservative Party in the UK. Let's go to the main opposition 
Labour Party because not without their own difficulties. No, not great news for them at all. They have been pushed into third place because the Liberal Democrats seem to have enjoyed a resurgence, perhaps because they had a very clear line on Brexit that they wanted to remain. Labour, on the other hand, had this sort of rather contorted position. It was sort of for a referendum, a second referendum, but only in certain circumstances. Voters obviously got confused, and that's why we saw the falling away of Labour votes to the Lib Dems in the South. But in the North, Labour actually lost votes to the Brexit Party. So for them, it's almost like they did the splits in this election, uh, and it's left many Labour figures, senior Labour figures, I should say, in despair. Talking about splits, yes, the Brexit Party have done well, but also if you add together all the Remain uh, leaning parties, it comes out at about equal. So, uh, very briefly, another difficult divide in the UK. Indeed, uh, people are trying to read the runes of these results to see what might happen in a referendum, but it is very hard to do that. I think it basically it's a sign that Britain is still polarised still divided. Okay, Naomi, thank you very much. Uh, and that's where we'll leave it. We're back with more coverage very soon. I'm Duncan Golastani, and you're watching BBC News. Hello, it wouldn't be a bank holiday weekend without some rain around. Unfortunately, those of us who need it most have actually seen very little and Sussex was one of the counties which avoided most of the showers on Sunday. By contrast, we've had a lot of rain across parts of Scotland, particularly Highland and Aberdeenshire, as much as 30 millimetres, well over an inch in just 24 hours. Now, this frontal system lingers as we go into bank holiday Monday across Scotland, so that's going to keep further rain going chiefly across the central belt, southern Scotland, down into parts of the far north of England and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a day of sunny spells and scattered showers, but the showers most frequent across northwest and southwest England and Wales. A brisk west or northwesterly wind will push them a little bit further into the Midlands, some southern counties of England, but uh, fewer showers across East Anglia and southeast England. More in the way of sunshine here, so that means higher temperatures, 18 or 19 Celsius, mid to high teens for most, but just 9 or 10 Celsius for the far north of Scotland. We'll keep some showers going through the evening. They will tend to fade, but some showery rain reforming across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales, eastern Scotland, elsewhere a mixture of variable cloud and clear spells. But it will be a cooler night compared to the nights we had through the bank holiday weekend. So on into Tuesday, we've still got this little frontal system diving its way southward, still generating showers. The winds will be lighter. But they are coming from the north or the northwest, so the cool air that we've been seeing across Scotland will start to dig its way a little bit further southwards. A cool start to Tuesday for many. There'll be some bright or sunny spells, but on Tuesday, quite a few showers developing across central and eastern areas. The best chance for East Anglia and South East England to see some decent rain will be from these showers, but they are going to be somewhat hit and miss. Fewer showers further west, best of the sunshine here. Temperatures for most in the mid-teens, maybe 17 or 18 Celsius across southern England where we get any sunshine. Into Wednesday, we've got this area of high pressure building from the southwest, so that's going to kill off most of the showers across England and Wales. Should be a dry and fine day here. Still some showers to talk about, chiefly across Northern Ireland and the western side of Scotland. After a sunny start for much of the UK, the cloud will build, but for much of England, Wales and southern Scotland, it should be mainly dry. Temperatures typically, again, in the mid-teens, 17 or 18 Celsius further south. So to sum up the week ahead, it's going to be feeling cooler for a time. There will be some rain, but for those who need it most, there may not be very much. Bye-bye. In a world of complex global news stories, we'll sift through the information to bring you what matters most. And with reaction and reporting in real time, our immigration laws are a laughing stock all over the world. You'll know what's happening around the world as we do. And that these new measures won't actually stop Venezuelans coming over. It will just make the migrant crisis worse. Whatever the story, we'll piece it together on Outside Source. Join me, Ros Atkins, Monday to Thursday at 9 on the BBC News Channel. Stories set to shape the news agenda. Headline.
lines. Freshly written. Original perspectives on the day's unfolding narratives. See the bigger picture as it emerges. The Papers, weeknights at 10.40 and 11.30 on the BBC News Channel. Hello, this is BBC News with continuing coverage of the European parliamentary elections. In the European parliamentary elections, there have been sharp falls in support for established centrist parties. Most of the gains have gone to smaller parties on the left and right, as well as the Greens. Voter turnout was significantly higher than the last elections five years ago. In the UK, the Brexit Party won most seats with just under a third of the vote. The governing Conservative Party received the lowest share of the vote in its entire history. However, the Liberal Democrats and Greens, which both want Britain to remain in the EU, made significant gains. In Greece, the governing Syriza party performed so badly that the Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras said he would soon call an early general election. The opposition New Democracy party appeared to be around nine percentage points ahead. Syriza was first elected to power six years ago on an anti-austerity programme. So just to recap where we uh, stand at this point, it's a story really in three parts, which is that the two main centrist parties have lost their overall combined majorities. These are the two big power players. Let's take a look at them there in the Parliament. You can see the European People's Party in light blue, still the biggest slice, but they have lost seats. And over on the left in red, the S&D, the Socialists and Democrats. Again, a large group, but much smaller. They have lost their uh, overall combined majority, which means that the power dynamic in Brussels and Strasbourg will have now changed because they will have to work with the smaller parties. It was a better night for populist and nationalist parties. Uh, Nigel Farage in the UK, Marine Le Pen in France, Viktor Orban in Hungary, and the Greens did very well uh, in many countries, including Germany, Denmark, and the UK. Turnout was much better than it has been, uh, well, for about 20 years, really. It's at 51% compared to 42.6%. Uh, five years ago in 2014. So that will be very heartening for EU uh, officials. Let's get a roundup then of the last few hours and how the EU is now looking with my colleague Ramzan Kamali. Over 200 million people have cast their votes in 28 countries across the European Union. That's a turnout of 51%, the highest in 20 years. Their verdict? Well, it's been a bad night for the mainstream parties that currently make up the coalition within the European Parliament. The leader of the Christian Democrats in Germany, the party of the current Chancellor Angela Merkel, conceded that her party hadn't done enough to persuade voters to stick with them. We haven't been dynamic. We have to concede that during our time in government, we haven't given the decisive answers that the people in Germany expect of us. The mainstream parties that make up a coalition in the 751-seat parliament looks to be lost. The centre-right bloc, in light blue, still looks like it will have the most seats. Its coalition partner, the Socialists in red, will still be in second. Both the Liberals and the Greens have made significant gains, and perhaps will now be part of a future coalition. Populist parties have gained ground in a number of countries, including France, where Marine Le Pen won her head-to-head -head battle with President Macron. Her National Rally Party looks to have edged out en marche. I see in this a victory of the people who have taken power back tonight with fierceness and dignity. We welcome these results with joy and the National Rally's name has never been more fitting. Whether you voted with your heart or your reason, be assured that a vote for the National Rally is a vote for France and for the people. The Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras called for an early general election after his Conservative rival New Democracy Party easily won. Perhaps the biggest winner amongst the nationalist parties, though, was in Italy, where Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini's far-right league 
is projected to beat the Democratic Party into second place. He wants to form a new alliance of right-wing nationalists across Europe. In the UK, it was a vote that wasn't supposed to take place for a parliament the British public have already voted to leave in 2016. And there's still a small chance that elected MEPs may not even take up their seats on July the 2nd, if Britain does leave before then. It's going to be quite a big win for the Brexit party, yeah. Which I'm pleased about. Nigel Farage and his newly formed Brexit party is set to win ahead of the pro-Remain Liberal Democrats. Though the big story is how the two dominant parties, the Conservatives and Labour, saw their share of the vote capitulate. Between them, they couldn't even secure a quarter of all votes. There'll be hardly any time before the next bit of important business for the EU. Leaders have been invited to a summit on Tuesday to decide who will get the top jobs, including the presidencies of the Council and the Commission. Ramzan Karamali, BBC News. Now, the UK wasn't supposed to be taking part in these elections, but divisions over a delayed Brexit have deepened, and it looks like that may have had an impact at the ballot box because Nigel Farage's new Brexit party, which was only formed around six weeks ago, has claimed victory in nine of the 11 regions. You can see there they have been projected to win 29 seats, up 29 because, as I said, they are a new party. The Liberal Democrats, who on the opposite side really want a second referendum on Brexit, well, they did very well. They're now on 16 seats. And you can see to whom it's come at the expense of the opposition Labour Party and the Conservative Party. So Britain as divided uh, as ever uh, on its approach to Brexit and its attitude towards the European Union. Now, the only region of the UK where the Brexit Party hasn't topped the poll is in London, where the Liberal Democrats have taken three seats. Overall, the party has gained 14 MEPs, as I just said, quite a contrast to the single seat they won in 2014. They are staunchly anti-Brexit. Their education spokesperson, Leila Moran, says the results strengthen the case for a second referendum. We went into these elections with a really, really super clear message stop Brexit, just make it stop. And I think what the vote share shows nationally is that it's, you know, we're second nationally, but if you add up the Remain vote, the people who want a people's vote, put it back to the people. So us plus the Greens, plus the SNP and Plaid, that is a bigger vote share than the Brexit party. And the clear message that I think the electorate is sending to Westminster is that we have to put this back to the people. Well, let's uh, take a look at that with our correspondent, Naomi Grimley. Naomi, uh, the Liberal Democrats there saying, well, it's quite clear cut. This is the case for a second referendum. It's not really that clear, though, is it? No, it's not, because if you add up the different uh, wings of British public opinion, you do seem to end up with a kind of 50-50 situation. It's hard to know, for example, where Labour voters stand, because, of course, that is quite a broad church of opinion, likewise the Conservative Party. But you can add up the uh, very much pro-Remain uh, wing and the uh, pro-Brexit wing, and you tend to get about 35% each way. So it doesn't really leave Britain any further forward in knowing what might happen if there was a second referendum. Now, regular viewers will know about the, the problems the governing Conservative Party have been having over the last uh, few days, weeks, months, um, particularly with their leader, Theresa May. But if we look at the opposition Labour Party, as you just mentioned, why is it that they have suffered, do we think? Well, they've had a very contorted position when it comes to Brexit. Uh, they have, uh, at times, seemed to espouse a second referendum and at other points seem to say that they want to respect the result of the original referendum. And that has left voters very confused, to be blunt. There's also this problem, this sort of north-south divide for the Labour Party. In the south, it's clearly lost voters to the Liberal Democrats who had this, as we've heard, this very blunt pro-Remain message. But in the northern constituencies, take Wigan, for example, Labour clearly lost votes to the Brexit party. And that's why you get, get some of the northern Labour MPs saying, don't be too hasty when it comes to then suddenly embracing a second referendum. Well, they might be saying that, but the last few hours here on BBC television, we have seen uh, Labour front bench spokespeople coming out and saying, 
this clearly is a message for a second referendum, but they have to persuade their leader, don't they? Indeed, uh, you're probably referring to Emily Thornbury, yeah. who said very bluntly on national TV that uh, uh, the, the party had got its message wrong, that it took five minutes, she said, to explain on the doorstep what the Labour message was. Clearly, a lot of very senior figures are fed up with Jeremy Corbyn. They feel he's too ambiguous on Brexit. They've been pushing behind the scenes. I think we'll see in the next few days a much more a vigorous message from them that they want to see him campaign against Brexit and for a second referendum. Thank you, Naomi. So divided Labour, divided government and uh, generally divided United Kingdom. Let's go to Italy, where the far-right League Party of Interior Minister Matteo Salvini won the most votes. Let's take a look there. It's League getting 28 seats. It's coalition partners, two down, five star there, getting 14, uh, losing three. Uh, the Democrats uh, doing well uh, as well. 24% uh, share there for them. Uh, the interesting thing there between the League and Five Star, the coalition partners in the government in Rome, is that it's almost the exact inversion of what it was in the general election last year. Uh, it was a fractious campaign in Italy, and it is likely to cause significant disruption to that governing coalition uh, because of their changing fortunes. Uh, Let's, uh, let's hear then from the man of the moment in Italy, Matteo Salvini, uh, and hear what he had to say. It is not only the Lega that is the first in Italy. Marie Le Pen has the first party in France. Nigel Farage is the first party in Britain. So Italy, France, Great Britain. It is the sign of a Europe that is changing, of a Europe tired of the powers of the elites, finance, multinationals, and from tomorrow, we will have to redouble our efforts. Well, let's get more analysis now on this. I'm joined by Beniamo Pagliara, editor of La Repubblica newspaper, and he joins us from Rome. Welcome to uh, BBC News. So what do you make of the results coming out of Thank Italy? You. Well, Matteo Salvini is for sure the winner of tonight's race, and, and there the jump the, the league has done from one year is some very exceptional result. Uh, as you were saying, the, the Five Star Movement, their, the league partner in this government uh, went very bad. And, and, and so I doubt that in, in the long term, uh, end of the year, uh, this government will be able to go on. Tonight, Salvini uh, was the one saying we will go on the government will work he he don't he doesn't want to be blamed for Italy without a government but but this is a political earthquake and it has uh, con it will have consequences very very soon especially when they'll have to uh, talk about the next budget just how divisive was the campaigning in Italy between those two coalition partners it was very divisive. We, we, we wrote a lot about uh, how uh, Matteo Salvini was blaming the Five Star movements for not running on some fiscal reforms or, or other issues, while uh, Luigi Di Maio, uh, the, the Five Star movement uh, leader, was blaming Matteo Salvini for not doing other things. Uh, there were personal attacks, there were uh, men, uh, politi politicians under uh, charge for, for, for many reasons, in, 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 especially in, in the league. So it was like bloody, very bloody campaign. And uh, now Salvini is saying, uh, we'll, we'll not, don't you worry, we'll work with, with them, they are friends. Uh, but what we know from this night is uh, that Salvini was uh, smiling and, and happily talking to all the, the press in Italy, while Di Maio uh, cancelled a presser he had in Rome, uh, and he didn't talk to, to, to anybody. This, it's like the picture of the moment. Well, that's a sure sign of unhappiness, isn't it? Uh, beyond Italy's borders, what do you think this means for Matteo Salvini? What do you think he'll do now with his power uh, beyond Italy's borders? 
Well, if I, if I'm not wrong, the numbers uh, say says he his uh, his group, the the league group, w will be among the biggest uh, in in Europe. So he probably is going to to have some power. I'm not sure though that that his uh, nationalist uh, movements will will have a key role and. Uh, uh, as, as we were saying, the, this, this election has brought many, many uh, Europeans to vote, like the, the highest turnout in 20 years, and uh, the two big parties uh, will have to face this and find new solutions. And in, in this particular um, area, I'm not sure the, the, the populars uh, will be uh, happy to talk with, with him. So. Uh, Angela Merkel made it very clear he doesn't want Matteo Salvini as an ally. So uh, he is very powerful now, uh, and he probably could play uh, the opposition again in Europe. Uh, that will probably boost again his polls, but then not work for for his Italy's government. So it will be very tricky to understand what's the next moves, and also. Um, Many times we don't have uh, long memories. Uh, uh, we, we don't remember things that happened recently. Uh, five years, there was another Italian, uh, Matteo. Uh, that, that time it was Matteo Renzi. Uh, his Democrats were at 40% five years ago, exactly five years ago at the European elections. And he is now out of, out of, uh, he, he's in the Senate, but he, he's not leading anymore the party. So Matteo Salvini will also be very care careful not to uh, follow that path. Okay, Benyama, really good to get your analysis. Thank you so much for joining us there from Rome. Benyama Pagliara, editor Thank of you. La Repubblica newspaper. Uh, we were saying earlier it's really difficult to generalize uh, about trends across the EU um, because it differs country to country and is as much about what happens within those countries as it does uh, the views towards the European Union and for no greater example for that than to look at Spain where the Socialist Party were comfortably uh, the largest party. Let's take a look at the results there. The Socialists getting 20 seats uh, up six, the People's Party down four on 12, uh, the Citizens Party losing five, and Podemos uh, up six as well. Uh, here's the Spanish Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez. La delegación del Partido Socialista en el Parlamento Europeo. The delegation of the Socialist Party in the European Parliament will defend the interests of Spain, will defend the interests of the social majority in any cities, regions, and also all the countries in the European institutions. Okay, let's go to Germany now. And I think this is one trend that we can pull out, which is that it has been a good night for the Greens in many countries across Europe. Uh, and we can see there their second row, 21 seats up 10. Very good for them. And it's come at the expense of Chancellor Angela Merkel's centre-right Christian Democrats. They had their worst ever performance. They were on 29 seats, uh, losing five. And the Social Democrats there uh, losing 11 seats, doing particularly poorly. So back to the Greens then. Scar Keller is a German MEP and co-founder of the European Green Bloc. And she's been speaking to my colleague Ros Atkins about why they did so well and what it might mean uh, for politics in Europe. We're very thankful for the trust that the voters all over Europe have put into the Green Party. And of course, for us, this is now a big task and also a big responsibility to put our demands into practice when it comes to climate um, protection, but also when it comes to making sure that the European Union becomes a social union. Now, those two big centrist blocs, the EPP and the S&D, are going to want to talk to you because they may need you in order to have a functioning majority. What do you want in return for voting with them on occasions? Well, for us it's very clear. We are the Greens and we want to put green policies into place. So um, we want to vote for policies of climate protection. We want to make sure we create a social Europe which is with social protection for everyone, social rights for everyone. And also we want to make sure that the rule of law and civil liberties are protected everywhere in the European Union, also for example in Hungary. So we're going to vote for green policies. 
Now, some people are skeptical of the European Parliament's ability to influence the other institutions of the European Union, in particular the Council and the Commission. Do you believe from your position within the Parliament you can do that? Yes, of course, because the Parliament is the normal co-legislator, so together with the, the Council, so the Member States, we're together doing the legislation, so no one can decide anything without the European Parliament, so we have a strong voice as Parliament, and we also now have a very strong voice for climate protection, for biodiversity protection, and we're going to use that voice. Scar Keller of the Greens there speaking to my colleague Ros Atkins earlier. It was also a good night uh, for populist and nationalist parties. Nigel Farage in the UK, Matteo Savini in Italy, who we've spoken about, but also Marine Le Pen, France's far-right national rally leader. She finished ahead of President Macron's En Marche party. Le Pen lost out to Macron in a bitter presidential contest in 2017. Now she's calling for the head of state to dissolve the parliament and call new elections. Unsurprisingly, that proposal was immediately rejected by the government. Let's have a listen to Ms Le Pen speaking earlier. I see in this a victory of the people who have taken power back tonight with fierceness and dignity. We welcome these results with joy and the national rally's name has never been more fitting. Whether you voted with your heart or your reason, be assured that a vote for the national rally is a vote for France and for the people. So as you might have seen, as we have gone through country by country across the 28 nations, some really quite interesting results. And we've looked at the big powerhouses, of course, uh, France, Germany uh, and the UK and the rise of uh, the right, the populists and the nationalists in the UK and Italy. Let's try now to make sense of it all, if we can, to see the bigger picture, the bigger trends, if there are any. Earlier, I spoke to our Brussels correspondent, Adam Fleming. What has happened here in the European Parliament tonight is that the stranglehold the big centre-left and centre-right political groups here uh, have had on the business of the European Parliament for decades and decades and decades has disappeared. Between them, the centre-left and the centre-right across Europe do not have enough seats in the European Parliament to control the agenda and to guarantee that legislation will get through. To do that, the, uh, they will have to rely on support from the Greens and from the much larger Liberal group now as well, uh, which includes uh, Emmanuel Macron's En Marche MPs and the Greens include lots of extra Green MEPs that have been elected tonight in places like Germany as part of something they're calling the Green Wave. So over the next couple of days, it'll be really intriguing to see, do those four big pro-European groups form a block where they all work together? Does that involve some kind of coalition agreement or some kind of roadmap for the next five years of EU business? But then you think as soon as the U groups in the European Parliament start building a roadmap or deciding the direction of the EU, they're going to come in conflict with EU leaders, the leaders, the prime ministers, presidents and chancellors of the member states, who will potentially see that as a big power grab. And the other thing that's going to unfold uh, here in Brussels in the next day or two is kick-starting the process for selecting and appointing those top jobs. A new president of the European Commission, a new foreign policy chief, because the treaties say those appointments are meant to reflect the results of the European Parliament elections. Now, is it the European Parliament that is going to call the shots on those appointments, or will it be the presidents and the leaders of the member states that do that? So I think I can fairly summarise that as lots to do and lots of uncertainty then, Adam. Let's drill down a bit into it. And the leader of the uh, European People's Party said earlier that there is now a shrinking centre. If, they, if a message is being sent to Brussels, do you think it's a message that they will respond to? Well, I mean, they don't have a lot of choice because if you look at how the, the seats are carved out in the European Parliament, the majority they're going to have now will be, as I said, made up of the centre-right, the centre-left, the Liberals and the Greens. And they are all broadly on the same page when it comes to being pro-European, although you get some people who are much more in favour of a bit more Europe um, and some people who are maybe a bit more pragmatic. So I think if you voted for somebody who is protesting, if you're somebody who doesn't want more Europe or is very anti the European project, then you're probably going to be disappointed because I predict the direction of this place is going to still be broadly pro-EU. And the reason that has happened is that this big populist surge or nationalist surge or whatever you want to call it, the labels are quite confusing and not particularly accurate, has not really materialised 
Okay, in places like Italy, Matteo Salvini's League Party did incredibly well. In places like France, Marine Le Pen's national rally came first, but they did just as well as they did last time. But then in other countries like Denmark, uh, then the, the populists and the anti-European parties did not do very well. So I think maybe if you're looking at the, the rise of populism, you're not really looking at a rise, you're looking at a kind of net result that is the same as the last time the elections were held in 2014. And I think that is one of the big surprises tonight. The populists, the opponents of the EU, are not going to be marching on the European Parliament with flaming torches to tear it down because they just haven't done as well as some people thought and some people feared. That was Adam Fleming, our correspondent in Brussels. Let me just give you then a reminder of our top story. With most votes counted in the European parliamentary elections, the previously dominant centre-left and centre-right blocs have lost ground to smaller parties. Some far-right groups and the Greens have made gains. Voter turnout was the highest in 25 years, uh, up to 51% from 42.6% five years ago, the highest uh, in 25 years, as I just mentioned. So the new Parliament uh, in Brussels will be more fragmented, which could make its task of shaping EU legislation that more difficult. Lots of power plays and horse trading in the coming days and weeks, and we have more coverage in just a moment.